Thank you, everybody, uh, for, for attending. Tonight's a big meeting. I know we've got some time ahead of us. And so I really appreciate you dialing in here on time. Uh, so Kirsten, I'll go mute. I'm gonna kick into the, uh, the agenda. We've got some formalities here to initiate and kind of take care of. And then I wanna maybe just set the scene before I charge into the agenda is that we will have a public comment period. It doesn't look like anybody's on right now. Brian, you'll be the one to maybe flag to us if there's somebody that dials in. We'll give an opportunity in the, in the, in the beginning and also circle back at the end, that's the plan. Uh, the idea is that we'll have probably a half an hour of kind of the initial background, where we are, where we were, the survey results and some of the parking model results. Take some Q&A. We want to be informal, go back and forth, but I also want to make sure that we spend the majority of the time really focusing about the management strategies. And that is where, um, uh, yeah, thanks, Jane. We'll do that. Um, when we do the introductions, we'll do that. Um, so. Then we're gonna spend the, really the majority of the time on the management strategies and identify the corridor, the segment by segment along the corridor, identify the key user groups and identify the management strategies. And so this is meant to be a really working collaborative meeting today. And the, the technical team needs to obtain information and hopefully to get consensus at the end of this meeting that we're headed in the, in the right direction in terms of which, which policies we need to flesh out in more detail. So uh, without further ado, let's see, and we'll do introductions here. Uh, Brian, maybe you can help facilitate just in terms of who's on the call, just say people's names and, and people can either say hello or just a quick hello, uh, just hi on the screen. Yeah, sure, that's fine. Um, and hello everyone, thanks for joining us tonight. I'm Brian Davis, I'm a transportation planner at Cheney County Regional Planning Commission. Um, you've heard John Slayson from RSG speak. Um, if it's for sake of efficiency, I'll just let people know who on the steering committee I have as present. Um, we've got Councillor Jack Hansen, Councillor Jane Stromberg, Kirsten Merriman Shapiro, Kelly Duggan, and Max Horowitz. And then at, in person down at 645 Pine, I'm Nicole Loesch with DPW. Mark Parla, City Councillor. And we'll introduce any members of the public when it comes down to the public comment period. Sound good? All right, so I have, um, I can't see the presentation, but you all can, is that right? Okay, great, I'm seeing nodding heads, so that's good. Okay, which is, I can't see it either, because I'm not looking. Okay, uh, <laughs> do we want to see this view or do we want to see it? Probably for March, we want to see the presentation view, right? Okay, so, so are you able to shift that? Is it, did I change it? I think so. Okay. Oh, there, there we go. go. All right, we're good. <laughs> technology here. There we go. Cool. Thanks, Nicole. All right. Uh, any proposed changes to the agenda here? We have the public comment period. We're going to go through the survey results, the parking model, and a little bit of future conditions, and then spend the majority of the time on six and seven, which are the management options, and then a public comment period at the end. Any nays to that? All right. Thank you. So we'll proceed. Uh, background here hasn't changed. The team structure is that RSG is the consultant working under this project, along with the city of Burlington and the Regional Planning Commission, represented by Brian here tonight, is the uh, technical resourcing. Just a reminder, uh, the seven members, who we are, I think we're still missing Charles. And now where we are today is that the city council gave us direction for this committee. We need to approve the scope of work, which we have done. We've developed the engagement plan and we've uh, worked collaboratively on the, on the survey element. And then now we're at the point of reviewing recommendations for the draft parking management plan. And so it's a collaborative effort to develop those recommendations. And then there'll be a subsequent meeting to uh, approve the written narrative that will be forthcoming. And then there'll be some meetings afterwards in terms of NPA presentations and the city council presentations. And so there is, there is a slide at the end of the slide deck that has the schedule to it. Uh, the committee structure is a public body, so we've not been coordinating with any of the members uh, outside of the public meeting. We are discussing the, the plan here and we're following all the open meeting law requirements in terms of advertising the materials and posting the materials online. 
And uh, there is a procedures there if anybody were to click on it. Uh, we amended it after the second meeting, I think, uh, with some, um, some edits that were proposed. Reminding us back to why we're all here and the concepts here, just to highlight, is that we're identifying practical strategies for balancing parking supply and demand and with the goal of meeting essential parking needs while freeing up space for the dedicated bike plan. And so again, to be explicit, the plan is for bike lanes in this corridor with the uh, physical limitation that it's gonna require to removing some of the east side parking along the corridor to free up that space. And so our goal tonight is to how to manage then the available supply as well as uh, manage the demand for that parking over the, uh, the next few years. And so we're gonna achieve that goal by convening this committee and engaging with you all and the public. So we've taken a phased approach Phase A was largely a technical exercise to get a lot of the data collected and the modeling set up. And then phase B has used that modeling data as well as conducted a sophisticated, a comprehensive survey, web survey of users in the area to understand their behaviors, but also um, then develop these management strategies and do the reporting. So uh, without further ado, any public comment period. I saw Jane, you are here and Brian, do you want to see if any hands or anybody wants to speak? Okay. Four raised <laughs> hands so far. So Brian, you're able to facilitate, is that right? Either one. Yeah, Brian, if you'd like us to do it, just let us know. You're muted, Brian, I see here. Oh, sorry. Um, all right, I'm just going to start at the top. Um, Gene, um, you should be able to talk now or unmute yourself. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I had questions about um, when the the um, supposed availability was surveyed in terms of parking spaces, because I live on North Wynaski between Grant Street and North Street. And the, I mean, were they, were, did you survey during COVID or something? Because there is regularly zero parking there today. I uh, last night I checked at 10 p.m. There was one spot in this 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 um, stretch. I left this morning at 10 a.m. One spot. I just came home from work at 6 p.m. One spot. There's already so little parking. I work, live, and rent my duplex, and my I have two tenants who are who are currently trying to leave and get subletters because they can't find parking. So I'm really concerned about this plan and it feels, um, it feels, uh, yeah, really, really unfortunate to me. Okay, I, I can answer it real quickly is that the data was collected in uh, throughout 2018 as part of the original Winooski Avenue corridor study. Okay. And particularly, particularly the North to Grant section, even back at that point, we're showing that uh, the lowest occupancy was somewhere around Friday, late AM at 70%. So I completely agree with you that the majority of the time is between uh, 70 and 100% and of occupancy is what we've observed. And that aligns well with, with what we're uh, using today to inform this work. Okay. So is this, is this intended solution that more parking lots are created such that I mean, am I supposed to turn my backyard into a parking lot or something? It's really confusing because there's so many cars that are going to need to be relocated. And we have, and I, I read the proposal and I didn't see any, no one was willing to share their parking lots. No one was willing to, just very curious. It's a very good, good question. And that's exactly why we're here tonight to figure out what the strategies will be. So yeah, there will be another round um, for public comment after we talk through some of those strategies a little bit. So. Yeah, okay. we need to chime back in after um, once we hear a little more conversation about those options. All right. Thank you. Oh, Brian, you're muted again. Sorry about that. I thought I unmuted. Um, next up is Reese. 
Hi, um, Reese Whitworth. I work for Pathways Vermont. I'm the mental health services director there. Um, we operate the Pathways Vermont Community Center at 279 North Winooski. And um, I know in the past we advocated for an ADA parking spot in front of our building. Um, in general, I think awesome um, conceptually to, to put in additional um, bike infrastructure. Um, we're just concerned specifically about that ADA spot, as well as how we could provide supports, not only for the population we serve, which is like a broad range of folks, some of which who have disabilities, some of which who um, are receiving financial assistance, like how do we create more um, bicycle access in that corridor? Is there any possibility for partnership with like the rideshare program, which I know has discounted rates or free free subscriptions for folks on EBT so that, you know, and I know there are a variety of other nonprofits in that corridor, right? So perhaps could we think about adding a ride share station in the corridor or getting um, bike parking um, on the street where some of these businesses and nonprofits are? Thank you for the comment. Thanks. And Reese, could I clarify when you say rideshare, uh, do you mean the car share Vermont specifically or um, green ride bike share? The green ride, thanks. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that. Great. Um, Jane, I see your hand raised. Hi, everybody. Uh, looking forward to the meeting. I, I read the, through the presentation and just as you're going through the slides, one thing that I was hoping to get a better sense of is the magnitudes, which is you have various strategies to address the excess demand for parking that will be created um, when those spaces are removed. And it was hard to tell whether those strat you think that those strategies are going to fill the projected gap between demand and supply that will be created once the current plan is implemented. So any sense as you go through the slides of how, how, how many, you know, the, the, the effectiveness in terms of actually reducing demand or increasing supply of the various strategies. Thank you very much. Jane. Um, Liz, I see your hand up. Uh, yeah, thanks. I just wanted to ask the committee to um, consider this question as we go through the presentation, which is the term essential parking. It, that seems like that's one that's in the eye of the beholder. And I'm just wondering who gets to define what essential parking is or means? Is that just a technical term from the planning community, which is overwhelmingly um, highly privileged, white and middle and upper income. Actually. And I wanted to ask how, how we're in developing these strategies, how we're single parents with young kids and people with a black and brown skin involved and how are low income renters involved? How was outreach conducted to all of these marginalized groups and whose voices were um, considered in the survey beyond the 766 respondents, 240 of which were residents when one block alone has 140 apartments. So, um, you know, how was this survey really uh, administered at scale and inclusively of marginalized voices? Thank you. Thanks, I think uh, we will we'll touch on how we got the word out on the survey and then some of the results of how we were accommodating and reflecting uh, uh, the representation from the residents effectively in the survey. And so there's some, uh, I'll discuss that when we get to the survey pieces and Nicole can help me answer how we got the word out. And then, yeah, we'll also get to that question of how we're defining essential parking. So yeah, very good question that we will, we will definitely hit on later. Thank you, Liz. Um, Chris Rivers. Thank you. Um, I uh, also live on North Winooski. I love to bike in town. I'm proud of Burlington and what it's done to provide 
safe biking lanes and I bike all over the place and I drive my car. And um, it sounds to me like this is a done deal, like this bike lane is going to happen. Um, I have yet to really hear or understand any real practical strategies for replacing the parking that's going to be taken away. Um, but getting back to the biking, I don't, I just don't understand, and maybe it's too late for this commentary, but why bikers can't just like cars go one street over east to Union and travel safely on that road instead of taking all these parking spots up. It's just so impractical in a city that does a wonderful job with bike lanes. I don't understand how we've gotten here. Um, and I just think um, it's, it's crazy uh, to put it bluntly. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Um, Cara. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Thanks. I'm, my name's Kara Greenblatt. I also live on North Winooski, the block between North Street and Grant. Um, I had the same question as one of the earlier commenters on what defines essential parking. Um, it, I couldn't find any, any you know, specific criteria listed in the presentation. So if someone could answer that, it would be helpful. Um, also just wanted to point out some, um, what looked like errors to me in the numbers. Um, the Burlington property database shows that there are 141 units on our block, um, but in the presentation, it says 118. Um, this is kind of important numbers if you're gonna be modeling from them and could skew the data towards um, looking like there's more parking than there actually is. Um, so it seems to me we'd want to get those numbers correct before, uh, you know, um, doing analysis on modeling that comes from them. Um, another comment, um, the, I filled out the survey and I remember there was an emphasis or a lot of questions relating to permit parking. Um, I think somewhere in the presentation, it said something about only half, uh, you'd be, there'd be about half of the, the households that need them would be getting permits. I don't understand how, how that could work, where are the rest of us supposed to go for parking. Um, and also just repeating something that was said earlier, I, I also, I think it was two weeks ago, I counted three times in the evening that I had to drive around my block at least once to find parking um, in the evening. And I, I just, I can't imagine it getting um, worse than that by 100 spaces being taken away on the street. So uh, again, like Chris River said, I just, I, I, I'm a biker, I'm an avid biker. Um, I, I don't see why we can't use the bike lane over on um, Union instead of taking away 100 spots from residents. And the, the majority of us are residents who use them here. So um, I, I don't know if it, again, it's too late for this commentary, but I wish I had known earlier and been involved in the decision about going forward with the bike lane. Um, it just doesn't seem to be a practical solution. Thanks. I'll mention the, uh, the the housing unit number real quick is that we've used 131 in this analysis. Mm -hmm. There's a little bit of room for error that creeps in. We're using a pretty large data set and it might have been a manual error in terms of using the data set. We use the BED meter data as well as a housing set that's been used at the regional level. So um, at, the, at the end of the day, uh, that magnitude, I think you're going to see how we're going to discuss how the model informs what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Because any model is, is not perfect. I would strongly just suggest that we, the, the level of error there is reasonable given the error in the overall, the, the amount of uh, margin that we see any given day on the amount of parking that happens. And so at the end of the day, we're using the model to inform where we're gonna see stress and what magnitude of stress but we're not, we're not gonna forecast whether there's nine cars or eight cars out there. The point is, is that it's gonna be 
at that percentage level relative um, at, a, at a consistency. So hopefully that hopefully I explained that at least clear enough on that number. And I do apologize that we missed that, but the 118 was one number that came from the July presentation. And now we have 131 in this in the new data set. Um, and then I've, I've heard the other comments that you had there. And the one thing about the residential parking permit, it might have been just a, a misinterpretation, or I'll say clearly for the record is that there was no uh, there's no recommendation that only 50% of the residents get a parking permit. And so the idea is that a parking permit program is clearly a, a policy and a management strategy that we're going to discuss today. But in terms of the how it is implemented, that has not been defined yet. Thank you. Brian, anyone else? Yep. Um, in the chat, uh, there's a comment from Alan O'Brien uh, from the Community Health Centers of Burlington, whose comment is, we're equally concerned for patient care and where our patients will park in an already highly congested parking area. Okay. Thank you. Comment noted. Uh, and that is all I'm seeing right now. All right. Thanks, Dan. So we're going to go into the, the public survey piece a bit here. And as I mentioned, there, there is the presentation that's available online and it sounds like people are accessing it. So that's a great thing. And then, so that way we're going to just highlight a couple of the, of the key takeaways, at least as, term, as to the way that it's informing the questions that we're asking about the management strategies. But some of the most important fundamentals here about the survey is that Surveys are important pieces of information. And unfortunately, we had to do it by web because of COVID. And we did an effort here that is not typical with a web survey of this nature on a type of a corridor study. And we were able to do direct mailings throughout the whole study area with this postcard to invite residents to participate. We also had postcards delivered hand delivered to numerous businesses and other organizations throughout the corridor. I know the community health center posted the, the survey as well as potentially sent it out on an email blast. We also had some specific engagements with, um, with communities, uh, particularly those that are new Americans. And we did a comp an effort to engage them and provide translation services for by AALP where they were able to walk through the survey with individuals and fill it out on their behalf. And so we were able to track how many respondents, so 29 individuals took that, uh, took that up. So that was a really great opportunity to get uh, their voice heard. Now, a, a, a piece that is really valuable to know here is that because of the way we sampled the data, because of the way we engaged and sent the invitations throughout the study area, we felt like we could st statistically and robust, uh, robustly do a weighted survey response. And so for the residents of the study area, we weighted the demographic data, the respondent data to census data. And therefore we have the representation from those who live in the study area, the 243 respondents uh, represent the users of the study area explicitly. And the other users are a convenience or they were self-selected to participate in the survey. And so we are not able to weight them to represent the census data. Uh, this, is a, this doesn't ha typically happen in surveys. And I think that was an effort that we really focused on here to be representative of the population in the study area. Nicole, anything else or Brian, do you wanna say in terms of the, how we engaged um, the, the population in the web survey? Kristen? Could you, <clears throat> pardon me, could you um, talk a little bit more about the outreach to new Americans and what that consisted of? You, and, and sort of what you heard in that, from that specific uh, out engagement outside of the survey? Outside of the survey, I did not participate in any direct engagement oh. with those Americans. Um, and Brian, maybe you can weigh in a little bit here because you were uh, helping us coordinate the ALV 
outreach um, would be maybe best. Yep. So we um, we worked with AELV um, to take advantage of their interpreter services, um, but we didn't want it to be one way communication where we relied on people to either um, you know see the lawn signs posted or receive the mailed postcard or see the ones that we were handing out or visit the website or whatever. We had also asked the interpreters if they could engage with their communities. Um, and we had done this with a different project as well, which had some success. Um, so we wanted it to sort of be a two-way channel of communication, not just relying on people to go to them, but also ask them to do some outreach too. Um, we extended the survey to give um, people extra time in order to respond, uh, and to John's point, to make sure that we were capturing all the people specifically that uh, were representative of the people that lived in the neighborhood. Um, I will say that there's always more that we can do. Um, and we're always open to suggestions. Um, and we're currently trying to build uh, those relationships with different leaders of the communities um, so that we can have um, this consistent and ongoing conversation about different projects happening, particularly in the Old North End. Um, but um, we did the best we could now. We offered incentives. We heard a lot of people that were interested, um, but were you know favored having an incentive offered. So we did provide gift cards to a random selected uh, number of people, um, which we thought would be helpful in getting people to respond as well. Thank you. Kirsten, to your point, uh, we're not gonna dwell on it because the data is just pretty comprehensive, but on slide 21 of the presentation, there is a set of tables there that show some of the demographics of the response of the resident data uh, and the census data and those, the demographics of those who responded to the survey. And so you'll see that there, uh, there are certain characteristics of either race or income that do differ, but on the whole, um, it was, it, it's, it's not bad uh, data and we were able to easily weight the data that to then become representative. There, there's a lot of data and I you know, confess, I'm still trying to absorb it all. Uh, yeah, that's, <laughs> uh, thank you. The data just keeps coming, doesn't it? So um, the point is, is that there'll be a period to reflect upon all this and obviously come back for questions. Uh, so residents in the study area, I'm just gonna highlight a couple pieces here that are important uh, in terms of how we frame the management strategies, in my opinion. 35% of the residents use the street for parking, either due to a lack of a driveway or it's typically inconvenient in their driveway space. Uh, that aligns pretty well with what we were modeling is that we were in the 25% area, 20 to 25% area. We were overestimating the amount of commercial users using the street versus the residents, but in the total magnitude, we feel really good that we're, that we're modeling that. 25% uh, of the residents would bike more in the study area if it was safer. That's a helpful data point, particularly given the, uh, the context of the bike lanes. Um, we do understand that residents are, they're sensitive that the residential per parking permit system might work for them and that it would, uh, wouldn't affect their travel so much when they're visiting the area or that they, they seem to have a positive response. So over 65% of the people indicate that a parking permit would generally increase their visits to the study area. So that's how we're uh, conveying that that's a relatively positive response to that particular question. Um, because residents can answer the survey as both residents, and then they can check the boxes, whether they also visit, whether they shop, whether they work in the corridor, residents can take on various different points of view. I will say maybe the first part is the first bullet there is important is that they own vehicles at a slightly lower rate than the region, state, and national averages. This area of the city does own vehicles. Um, aside from college students, these, this geographic area of the city does have the lowest vehicle ownership rates. Um, yeah, that last bullet is just a little confusing, kind of. And I wonder if people understand how residential parking permits work. That's I, all. You don't, you don't have, we don't have to talk about it. We can talk about how they work later in the presentation as they're one of the strategies. So. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, employed persons in the study area, also just a couple of key points is that the uh, employed persons, about 54% report parking on the street. And as I said, our, our parking model estimated about 60% of people parking on the street. So it's relatively close. 
but um, and then we have 13% parking on side streets in the study area, and then 4% are outside of the study area. So I know Councillor Hansen was interested about how we drew the study area, and I think both the residents and the employment data suggest that we that we captured it relatively well. It's very few parking people parking outside of the study area. Uh, we also report that the residents that basically employees don't want to pay for parking. That's consistent throughout the study area. Uh, and then we realize that employees are willing and interested in parking off in shared off street lots, whether it was their own place of employment or not. And we'll contrast that with another point of view here in a minute. Uh, visitors, clearly they visit the corridor using a more diverse set of modes relative to employees and relative to uh, those who resident who live in the study area. Uh, we realized that 43% actively or frequently avoid using a vehicle and almost the equal magnitude frequently do use a vehicle. Uh, we also realize that visitors are, are here infrequently. 65% of the visitors are here for one day or less a week. And then 80% of all visitors are just two days or less a week on average. So that helps us try to scale the, the magnitude and the frequency that people are visiting the corridor for various reasons. Uh, we also know that visitors are willing to park a little bit further away and do some more walking along the corridor. Now, owners and managers are places of employment. Now, this is, um, is a difficult one, is that their current needs for loading happens to coincide with the busiest times for parking, as well as the busiest times of traffic. It's not surprising, but we realize that in other parts of the city, there is a bit of management around truck loading, and maybe there's some flexibility here in the future uh, to, to uh, push those periods either earlier in the day or in a, in a quieter time of the day. Um, we also know that owners and managers are not interested in sharing their off-street lots. <laughs> uh, only a very small handful did offer a sharing opportunity, and there was probably only about 20 spaces in total that was you know, potentially being shared, maybe, maybe 25. Um, we don't always know exactly which lot people are responding to, depending on which questions they, uh, they answer in the survey, because some questions are optional. And so they appear split in terms of reducing, introducing metered spaces or more time limited spaces. And so that's something that I think is, is an opportunity for us because it's not clear one way um, for or against. They realize that it could, um, it could benefit them. Now the owners of the other properties are the residential units. And we realize that majority of people do not charge for parking. There were some owners that do charge for parking and they discussed that. And there was a lot of open responses saying how um, people who are charging for parking are, are encouraging people to park on the street. Um, there, they acknowledge quite strongly that owners agree that it would be more difficult to rent or lease their property if they charge for parking. Uh, there's also an acknowledgement that there is not enough supply for the demand and I put here, it's, it's really subjective because we didn't say, are you providing X number of spaces per unit? We let them answer it as they see fit. And they, they uh, answered it themselves saying they don't have enough. So the majority, uh, our 44% don't provide enough spaces as, as it currently exists. All right, so here's some of the demographics. I'm not gonna spend any time here. Uh, it's, it's data for you to dive into and, and understand who we were, who was answering the survey. And then we have this other slide. This is again, all respondents on income and education. And then this is the demographic data that I mentioned to Kirsten there just a minute ago in how our survey data compares to the census data. And we were using all of these tables to do a, uh, a process to weight the respondent data to represent the attributes of the three census blocks of interest in the study area. And for that's using the American Community Survey. Now, 
equity is a component here and we're trying to understand essential needs as well as uh, who is affected and by what investments. And this is the best we could would do given uh, the limitations of the survey. We, in the first table here, we extracted how, um, households that have uh, income in the first row, less than $25,000 a year, and that were not college students. So maybe that's its own bias, but we wanted to check out residents who, uh, who are older than 25. And they report 25% typically driving a vehicle, 50% bike, 25% taking a bus. It's a very small sample. I don't draw a ton of value from it, but it is our only data point. We get a little bit larger sample when we extend that to households making less than $50,000 a year. And again, uh, more than 25 years of age is the respondent. And But the value that you do see is there's a general trend that uh, vehicle use is the minority in terms of other shares. Uh, and you add it all, all up. The American Community Survey data provides us a little bit more, uh, much larger data set to draw from, and it compares more racial uh, travel behavior. And it shows pretty clearly that the driving uh, data is fewer for those uh, that typically persons of color or are non-white in the sample in the study area. And again, this is uh, focused on the census tracts within the specific study area. So we're really diving right into this area uh, for, this, for this detail. So I only draw your attention because this is an important data point, I think for later on as we're looking as to who's affected by, by what policies. Here's another, uh, just a quick model that we pulled together using the, uh, again, American Community Survey using their, it's called the Public Use Microsample data set. So it's a little bit more detail. And we're able to understand the median household income for Northwestern Vermont specifically. How much does the, so the typical for, for two vehicle homes, their median income is $98,000 per household. That's what this data is showing is that so for the households that are owning six or more, the median household income is $177,000 a year. Uh, it just simply shows again another relationship between vehicle ownership and income. Which, is, uh, which was meant to be one of those connections on that first table on that last slide. And maybe it's implied, but if you don't own a vehicle, then you don't need to buy parking for it. All right, so setting the scene here, and we're gonna start cruising because we do wanna get into the, the meat of it, but um, if there's any questions, Kirsten or anybody else, uh, we, uh, speak up. Basically, within the study area, we have 1,600, we have 1,630 parking spaces. We estimate there's 223 along North Winooski itself and 141 along side streets. We have 1,266 spaces estimated for off-street spaces. We did that manually looking at Google Earth and visiting and walking along the corridor to try to estimate how many parking spaces are behind everyone's parking uh, buildings. So it may not be perfect, but it's our best estimate. Now, uh, some of it's restricted off street, so they're dedicated for residents or specific commercial uses. Other ones that are shared with a few uses, on average, were about 1.3 spaces per household unit uh, in the corridor. Now, we turn that into a model. Again, we spent a lot more time last time, so I'm not gonna talk about it as much. Uh, there is a methodology that's been adapted and well used called shared parking. And it was, it's, it's made for a multiple land uses or generators that create demand that go into one parking lot. What RSG was able to do is turn that into multiple generators into multiple lots. And we are able to then spread the demand across multiple lots to understand where that demand might go. And that both allocates it to off street locations as well as to on street locations. And we, built that model using a range of data points uh, collected from occupancy data that was pre-COVID. We also collected it using, we calibrated it using parking rates from other studies. There's a number of residential parking studies that have been collected um, in the city of Burlington that, uh, that give us confidence about the parking ratios of how many cars per unit of square feet or per unit of household 
And we also recently did this for the city of Lubuski, which has a very similar profile for vehicles per, per uh, household and per square footage of commercial spaces. Uh, so this is a table that does aggregate a bit, maybe too much, because I think the point that others made uh, on the north to grant here is saying we think the occupancy is a little bit more than this. And this is when you average throughout the whole, the typical weekend average or the whole weekday as a whole. You can see that some spots on the weekend are quite busy and then some spots on the weekdays are, are quite busy. And that 85th percentile is typically when management strategies are are really uh, warranted or should be considered. This table is for your own records again, but it dives into a little bit more uh, point in time data about where the occupancy falls. We can see, I was highlighting the PM peak period because by and large, that is the period of greatest demand if you take the whole corridor at, at large. And you can see that the Grant to Pearl area and the North to Grant are quite busy. And there's some periods that exceed capacity. The Archibald to Union Decatur area is quite busy, over 100%. So uh, without defined spaces, sometimes people can really um, get multiple cars in there. So this gives us some of the data that we were calibrating the model to and understanding how the parking um, was, was performing. So now we're gonna go through um, kind of the existing conditions, which we have largely summarized in July. And so again, I'm going to move pretty quickly here because I also have these existing conditions on other plots that will show um, in, in the future. But each of these sections goes through kind of a conversation to say, what is the current condition? What's happening on the street? How's it being managed? We understand that certain areas are more constrained than others. Uh, in this situation, there's fewer parking spaces off the street per relative number of households that are here. So we realize that that's already a constraint. We also understand that the health center itself has, um, I think we've confirmed by emails, but north of 100 employees and approaching maybe 140 employees. And it's hard to know how many existing on, on any given weekday, but there's 76 spaces on site and roughly half of them are dedicated to employees. And then the other half is, is allowable for first come first serve. So there's clearly a lot of demand coming from this very important um, use. Uh, and, and they don't have enough spaces on site. And currently, probably visitors are using some of the limited um, one hour parking spaces along the side of the street or the two hours on the east side. But they also use the unmanaged riverside spaces quite heavily. Uh, moving south, this area is extremely busy. Uh, we realize that probably the demand comes from uh, multiple uses. We, we know that the, the 294, there's just so much diversity there. Gosh, it, it, it's hard to provide a model to, to estimate those uses. And that's always been a topic of conversation among the team. But, but we also know there's some very large buildings, Vermont Legal Aid. And, and if, if they generate parking at the rate that, that an office building does, they far exceed their, their current off-street uh, off spaces. So uh, there's definitely some land uses here that are, that are sensitive um, and busy. The unbundled parking at the Redstone, um, that from the survey, it acknowledges that there's users trying to actively avoid parking there. Um, so we acknowledge that. Uh, and there's, there's only a handful of residential locations. Uh, so largely it's a peak weekday kind of condition here that we're seeing really uh, max out the occupancy. You can see the model occupancy basically says it's full up um, as soon as people show up to go to work. All right, so heading south, this is a section that is- the also, also, sorry, I just want to make sure everybody realizes also the, the feeding Chittenden's right there as well, right? Down at the bottom of the corridor, that's part yeah. of it. And we model that land use. It, these, these areas are not, uh, the, the land use is, is modeled, they could go anywhere within a 600 foot radius of where the land use goes. But, but Kirsten, I would love your observation here, but from our, from our observations, we show that they're generally fine in terms of meeting their off-street parking needs. Is, is, there, is there something that I need to know about that use? Um, well, they have 17 employees and they have, you know, uh, I think well over like 12,000 visits 
annually. They're very busy. People are coming there a lot. That's all. 17 people employed on, on a... And on, then they have deliveries, too, and I, I don't have more details on that, but I, I just know from talking to them that they have are concerned. So I just want to make sure that, to me, that's another generator of, of use, and it's just a, it's an unusual one, right? Yeah, well, that's what, um, that's our job as, as humans at the end of the day to make sense of what the data tells us and how to make a management system that can hopefully work for us. Uh, so this section is primarily residential and they typically have some of the most, uh, the, the highest number of parking spaces off street relative to demand. And so by and large, the existing occupancy is, is fairly, it, it's some of the, the lowest in the corridor. Uh, the east side is, is, is more heavily occupied than the west side. Uh, maybe there's more turnover, whatever it might be, but uh, that's the kind of the way that the existing data is showing and it models, um, it matches the model quite well. North Street to Grand Street. So we've talked about this. This is the most dense residential part of the corridor. Uh, you could tell I, we've estimated with 131 housing units but there are an average of 1.5 spaces per unit provided, but, um, but clearly the demand is, is pushing off onto the street. Uh, we can see that demand gets closer to that higher 80% during that, during that time. Um, with the, the occupancy being observed so high at other times of the day, I'm curious as to whether people are able to use their driveways, whether there's just a greater, if, if, if it's 90%, people are probably maxing out their driveways. Um, we were surmising last time that people are parking in this section that can't park in the Southern area or they're, or they're visiting other land uses further away. Um, so I don't want to get into a huge discussion right now, but I would love to get your feedback afterwards if there's any specific observations around this corridor to help us better understand what, what is happening because the current model does forecast that, or it, it, it suggests that we're only 50% kind of at the nighttime period. And if that's clearly not the case, A, the model might be underestimating the, the amount, or it might be over parking driveways, or people are parking here that don't live here. That's kind of the two main things to take away. Um, so the Grant Street to Pearl Street section, is the second most dense residential area and they have the fewest off street spaces. So this is the corridor that currently is very managed. There's existing meters throughout and it's available then for residents on Sundays or after 6 p.m. Um, and it's basically full up the parking occupancy data and the model. This, uh, it just shows that it remains very full in the future as well. Uh, there's 50% already fewer parking spaces for that same level of demand. So this, this area will, um, will have to find other parking, not in this area. They're gonna to have to walk further away uh, if, they, if they have vehicles at the same rate that they currently do. Uh, this is a table to again, uh, just show where the model was in terms of the existing data on the side streets. And Riverside Avenue, that small section there is really full uh, quite often. Hopefully it's not a surprise. Archibald is quite busy during the peak uh, weekdays, immediately east and west of the study areas. North Street, Crombie and Decatur are, are up, up there a little bit more. Crombie, less so. They definitely have an, a large number of off-street spaces per unit. Um, the so for a point of uh, clarification for everyone's benefit, when we the corridor study did its occupancy data in 2018, we did not count parking occupancy on Crombie or Decatur. And in July, we tabled this table uh, for the committee's kind of review and the general consensus was that it's, it's reasonably um, accurate. And so we've been working under that assumption. So again, if there's any particular comments or feedback on those results, I would love to have it sent after the meeting or send those comments directly. All right, so future conditions here. Um, the overarching theme is that there's we are proposing to remove east side parking between Riverside Avenue and Union. So coming from the north down. And then in that section that, that 
dense residential section. So between Union and North Street, that's going to remain parking on both sides. And then south of North Street, we're going to remove the other 42 spaces or so. That's uh, the estimate at 42 spaces and 33 spaces to the north. So it's 75 spaces total that's um, stated, slated to be removed. And <laughs> all right. Um, then the one change that has happened over the course of the project is that the zoning has changed. So in essence, the city has officially adopted a, uh, a there is no minimum parking required on any of the land use development within the corridor. And so that provides us a, a point of guidance that the city has already adopted as a policy that there's no minimum requirements that we have to maintain for the supply of parking. And it's just something to keep in mind as we go into the management strategies. Uh, it's obvious to say that the removing on-street parking will increase the occupancy of those existing spaces and likely some more of the off-street spaces. And it also probably stands to reason, based on what we just covered, some specifics or uh, some segments are affected more than others. All right, um, I'm just gonna just cruise through these, um, is that these charts are here for your own records. And I think they've slightly, I changed the format of them. So we'll get this new presentation uploaded to the website. Uh, you'll just see a slight change in the way that that's formatted. Um, again, to probably orient you more than discuss anything today is that uh, I find it valuable to understand how peak periods compare to the overall whole day. And that's how why the, why the charts are here so you can get a sense of what happens during the day. But then also, if we were to average the whole day out, this is the, the number that uh, that's just before that. So the 64%, 72%. Uh, so during the peak periods, it's, it's full up. But if we average it during the whole day, there are some spaces. It only just helps us to understand because you'll see a couple sections down below where the whole day is quite full. And so that gives you a, a sense of who's using the parking in the corridor. And so this corridor, given that it has some occupancy, it has some space available in the future, um, is that it's the commercial users that are really filling up these, these spaces. And that makes sense today because it's currently time limited anyway. We know that the residential users aren't parking there much during the middle of the day. Um, another data point just for you to kind of compare is that this just helps understand the scale of change in terms of how many total spaces divided by the sum of dwelling units and employees in the area. And so we're still having more than one space um, per dwelling unit and employee, even after doing all this. But, um, but we know that some spaces are off limits for others. So uh, it's an aggregate number. Okay, uh, this one is the, again, it continues to be very full and it's gonna force parking uh, onto Crombie and Decatur, probably more. And definitely we, we uh, estimate that it forces more people onto Archibald as well. Uh, the whole day is a little bit more full because there is there's a higher residential portion here, and so they'll they'll park on street um, as well longer during the day. These these future conditions all assume the existing management strategy is in place, which is none in these uh, in these sections. Um, so it's just anybody can park there for however long they want to park. Um, the Archibald, you can see how we forecast that that, it's, that grows and basically becomes um, full up during the sunny areas during the middle of the day. Uh, Crombie, we forecast to see a slight growth and then Decatur, a small growth as well. And so I'm happy to try to go and, and investigate there if, if we're underestimating the number of housing units or the, or the parking supply or something, if that's underestimating those models for those streets. All right. Uh, the next section, I see a little modest change of the parking demand and what we, the, the model helps us understand to say that there are people parking here now in the future that are, that can't park to the section to the north because it's so full. So people are walking or they're, they're moving further south and that's what's really increasing this occupancy because the parking supply doesn't change in the future. 
Uh, this section, we, we see that the number of parking spaces does go down. We still have more than one per kind of user, if you will. And, but the model does show that our current peak of kind of that 80% really goes up and it becomes full. And this is assuming with no management strategy, that means that people, again, can just park here as soon as they want and can last throughout the day. Uh, this is primarily residential in nature. And so the idea that if it's filling up during the middle of the day like this, they're coming from other places that can't, that, that can't fit them. And so that means they're probably coming from the south or they're coming from other commercial areas in, in nearby. But most likely, most likely it's coming all from the south. And the most southern section here is that the current management was modeled here where there's parking meters. Uh, those would remain on the east side, on the west side, excuse me. And that basically uh, we said there's a slight occupancy on that section right after the residents drive to work. But in the future, there's just so much demand, it's, it's full up all day um, in this situation. And again, this is the most restrictive part of the corridor with residents that, uh, that don't have parking today and they won't in the future. And so that's most likely why that Northern section is seeing a, a significant increase in demand. Jonathan, the, um, the slide deck I'm looking at, this, this Grant Street to Pearl Street, mm -hmm. the model and the one I'm looking at on the is uh, existing daily average occupancy 63% and uh, future daily occupancy 91%. Yeah, I think I caught an error in the version that was uploaded. So that's what this version will do. This, we'll, this is the accurate one that will replace the one that was uploaded. Right. Yeah. So. All right, so we're, uh, we're about right on time, a little bit behind but where we wanted to be, but the management strategies to give the committee and the public uh, kind of a, a flavor for what, what is out there in terms of managing parking. Here's a list of some options and some, a little bit of brief narrative about them before we go into a problem solving mode. I'd like to describe this as a menu of management strategies and that there's a typically an easier and a harder Set of, set of options here. Harder doesn't mean it takes more time. Sometimes it's money, sometimes it's policy, sometimes it does take just time to get behavior to change. Uh, so on the easier end of things, first off is that we could improve the definition of parking spaces. Sometimes communities benefit from not doing that because if you have a, a, a plethora of smaller cars, you can fit more cars in, in that limited space. Versus if you define every space, then you're limited to those spaces itself. But if we're gonna use enforcement mechanisms of time limited parking, meters and other things, then we need to have more definition of parking spaces. So I, I think we'll be thinking about the definition of parking is almost a, a do minimal option is that this is gonna be pretty common uh, throughout is that we're gonna probably have to improve the striping of spaces. Uh, designated short-term spaces. Again, this is a low cost initiative. It takes a sign, uh, it takes enforcement, however, but um, we can try to consider where in the corridor we can optimize short-term loading spaces. And things have changed so much in the last five years and we have yet to see what's gonna happen coming out of COVID, but um, Ubers and Lyfts, they were really busy along certain parts of the corridor and they only need a five minute. They, they just need a drop off space. We also know that in, in really constrained parking areas, maybe residential loading spaces might be of interest. And that hasn't been done before, as far as I know in Burlington. Uh, so we might be able to define these short-term spaces depending on the user and the user type. Um, and so we might have some flexibility there. The time limits to increase turnover. Clearly, if you're supposed to be there for only two hours and you don't have the option to keep beating the meter or, or get on your park, park mobile app or something, um, it's going to force you to move unless you get a, uh, if you get a ticket. So turnover is key, and particularly for high, for high turnover businesses like restaurants, they, they typically benefit from these faster time limits that increase turnover because people get in the door and out the door. Uh, then we could also talk about paid parking. Paid parking also encourages turnover. It also generates a revenue source that can pay for some of these things. Uh, I don't know, frankly, if Burlington, how all the parking monies are, are divvied out, but um, you could set up a basically a parking district here, which would 
uh, benefit some of the revenues that would be generated and spend them in the in the area that's generating those revenues. Uh, Kirsten already mentioned the residential parking permit out structure today, so we should we'll have a separate slide on that. But that's um, it's it's used throughout Burlington currently. Uh, Grant Street on the east of the corridor is the only one in this specific corridor and study area that has a, re a residential parking permit today in place, and it limits who can park there at all times of the day, I believe. And there's then these more difficult ones for sure. Do we add more off street capacity? Is it available in the corridor or maybe in a remote lot situation? And how far is that remote lot? Is it available by a bicycle, by a bus, or by some other means. Um, how infrequent could the use be so that it would make sense to have remote lots? Uh, for instance, UVM Champlain, they have remote lots and they, they make those work. So can it work in a residential or an employee um, area? Maybe. Lastly, mode shifts. We realized that that's really the, the aim of the city. Um, in some of the earlier work, we showed that the city has aggressive mode share targets to achieve for walking and biking and transit. And if we get more people to travel by those modes, there'll be fewer cars owned, fewer cars needing to be parked by visitors in the area if they are able to take these modes. So uh, these are all the management strategies. I have a couple slides, of, I have one slide on each, but are there any real basic questions now? And let's take just a couple of minutes from the committee um, if you wanna just discuss these, or if there's any questions on them. You explain them well, John. All right. <laughs> uh, we do have a question from the from the public. I don't know if you want to. Can you type it? Or I, I don't want to get too off 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 hand. But yeah, I think we can save that for the public. We'll comment save period. it for the public comment. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. All right. So we've discussed this. The definition. Here's some examples. Some of the signs that could be created here, if we have passenger loading zones, so kind of the Uber Lyft thing, we have 30 minute for a variety of users, 15 minute zones, clearly the difficulty is enforcing uh, the behavior in these areas. So how often are we having somebody there to enforce it? But um, it does give us a lot of options to meet some very specific needs. And, and like, uh, I think what Reese about the ADA spots as well. So that, that falls into maybe not short-term space, but it definitely falls into a managed space uh, discussion. Time limits. This is not a sign from around here, but anyway, you get the idea. A two hour limit for, for areas could be imposed elsewhere. Currently we have that on the east side of the northern section. Uh, paid parking. So currently we have paid parking in the most southern section. We have a handful of blue meters and then a handful of uh, brown meters. And do we, do we extend those further north? Uh, do they encourage the type of turnover that we want? Does it give us options? Uh, we could discuss that in the most northern part. Uh, I don't think we're gonna talk about the rate structure at all, but really the idea is that it's a combination both of time and rates, and you can try to really optimize your, your parking behavior. So residential parking permits, there's a whole process that's on the city, on the DPW and the, it's on the DPW website and then they direct people to the police department who um, manages or I guess enforces the, the residential parking permit. All on DPW now. No, it is. Recently. Okay. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So you still get directed to the website for the police, but I thought it was all here. So. Uh, Kirsten, did you want to pipe up and just say, is, is the RPP system that you have a major concern with? I just, I guess I, I just, so I'm really torn because it's the public right of way. And so then there's this whole idea of you're managing in that and, and then somebody comes to visit you and you've got to run out and make sure that they can get a parking permit, but maybe they had to park for like a half a block away. And then, I, you know, it's, it, it, I personally, at a personal level, do not understand or think it's a great thing because I think we all pay taxes to use the streets. But that's just me. And I know that perhaps it works in some neighborhoods for some people. I just 
I just want to make sure people understand sort of how it works and that sometimes it can also get oversubscribed. Yeah. But that's, maybe that's not happening anymore. Uh, I don't know. I think they issue still number of permits per unit. So uh, you never know. I don't think there is as strict a review of how many spaces, how many off street spaces, and then how many permits. So there, there are some nuances there, Kirsten, I agree. And Max, I think I saw you had a yeah. question or a comment too. Yeah, just a quick question about the residential parking permits. Um, what exactly defines the guest passes per dwelling unit? Each pass gets two guest passes. Is that a one-time use thing or is it, how does that work? Yeah, it's actually, it's a hang tag. And so it can be, yeah, like it, you can hand it out to whoever is visiting at the time and then you collect it when they're done. And so it's very transferable in that sense. Okay, so I guess my question is like, say I'm a student and I get a pass for myself and then use my two guest passes, like give them to my roommates or something. How long could they theoretically use them for? I, I don't know. The guest passes are attached to your regular permit, so it would be renewed every year. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Councilor Hanson? Yeah, I mean, this is probably a bigger question than this committee, because that's just the general policy. But I think Max's point is well taken that it's somewhat of a loophole because you could just keep putting the guest pass in your roommate's car, right? I mean, you could, but it still counts towards the, the overall cap of how many permits are issued. So that was one of the biggest changes to this program a few years ago, is there's still a, a cap on how many permits can be issued per household. Oh, okay, I understand. So I even, okay. So they would save money, but they wouldn't necessarily, it wouldn't like inflate the parking situation. In theory, yeah. I'd say it definitely provides more control than there was previously. And it, I'm sure in some streets it does not, um, it still doesn't give everybody access to a parking space on the street, but um, yeah, it is. it has helped in some of the situations. Got it, got it. Yeah. Right. Um, so quickly, I think I've discussed this. So just new street off, off street capacity, remote lots, mode shifts. Uh, Any questions just about these? Clearly, how they would be operated and designed uh, would have to be for consideration. There is no publicly owned lot that we're saying, hey, here we go, here's some new spaces for the city to consider. So this would be a private land uh, deal if there were to be new off-street capacity. So let's get into more dialogue here. It's been a lot of me and uh, sorry for that. The process here is that we are aiming to develop practical strategies for balancing and identify those essential needs. So part of this will be unfolding organically today because we're, we haven't had a conversation to say what is essential. And it is a little bit in the eye of the beholder as to when we realize that there's gonna be fewer parking spaces. So now what do we do? And that's really where we're at. Um, our performance measure is that in the future, if we were to keep the current management strategy, which is unmanaged for most of the section, aside from keeping the time limit in the far north and the pricing of the far south, basically the model says that we're going to have uh, basically 39 spaces or 39 cars. So we eliminated 75 spaces. And so we found home for some of them, but 39 cars basically said, I can't park within 600 feet of where I wanted to park. And so that's 5% of the estimated total demand was saying that that might not be able to be met. Um, that's just using a strict model to, to do that. So that gives us kind of a scale. And Jack, just real quick, uh, I ran another scenario as to say, what if we reduced our parking demand by 5% across the board? And what if we were successful in mode share and other, and other policies Largely that 39 does go away. 
So that's kind of that, that magnitude, that 5% buffer there is what we're playing with in terms of the total of the amount of demand in the, in the magnitude of the study area. Uh, Councilor Hansen? Yeah, I mean, that was going to be my question, and I still don't fully understand what you just said, with, but just the fact that with the bike lanes going in, you would expect some mode shift, especially like the survey confirmed that, but that's also just proven out in other examples where bike infrastructure is added. You do have more people, you know, using the infrastructure. And then this survey is also, you have a significant number of respondents saying that that that's the case. So what, shouldn't that be some what built in? I think that's what I didn't want to do. I wanted to at least say, what if we didn't change the management today and we assume the parking demands remain the same? That's what we're saying is that basically there's 39 cars that uh, are not able to be parked using the constraints in the, in the model. Now, what you just suggested is that that's probably unlikely, right? We're going to come up with management strategies and people are going to change behavior. Whether it's 5%, whether it's 2%, 1%, that's to be determined. And we don't know how people's behavior will actually shift. So I'm only providing us a data point that says, hey, if we could eliminate 5% of the parking demand, our, our parking problems or the parking constraints that, that are going to be faced might go away. Right. Yeah, I guess I'm just saying like we're this is the parking management plan where we're coming up with strategies to deal with supply and demand, but there's inherently one strategy. You, you know, you're talking about this baseline of no strategies, but there is inherently one strategy that's definitely happening, which is the bike infrastructure, which does have an impact. So I feel like in the same way that the other strategies we come up with here we're going to project that they have some impact and that's by the, that same logic we should assume that you know that infrastructure has some impact yeah i i agree we can explore what percentage we think because certain businesses are affected more than others certain times of the day are affected others but i i hear what you're saying so we'll try to build in that it's not there is going to be a bike lane there so that we need to estimate what the effect the bike lane might have on parking I don't know if there's someone ahead of me, but um, there is one. Okay, so I guess my comment is that we now know that having a bike lane is gonna necessarily have a positive impact on parking because households may have both cars and bikes. And if it's easier to bike for local transportation, but you still need a car for you know, longer distances, um, you may choose to bike during the day, during business hours and leave your car parked in one of on the, on the street if there's no meter or, or limits or if it's residential parking. So I don't, I don't know it's necessarily the case that we would um, improve parking by adding bike lanes. I mean, that's just something that seems sort of a natural consequence or a potential consequence to me. Yeah, good points. Uh, so are there any other members of the committee that have their hands raised? Um, could I add something? Yeah. Thank you. Oh, I just want to just going off of the bike lane and whether that will change modality and the strategy around that. Like, I just want to point out, so Old Spokes Home did our Old North End mobility audit last winter. Um, and a lot of what we heard was that the bike lanes in the Old North End already and across Burlington are just notoriously unmaintained through the winter. There's all sorts of problems like potholes and like cracks. And in many cases, during certain weather, like it's safer to be in the street or on the sidewalk than in a bike lane. So I just want to point out if, I mean, I know there's not a strategy, but if a goal is getting more people on bikes or getting more people walking, like the infrastructure really needs to be maintained for that. And I agree, like a lot of people in the Old North End are multimodal. And if it's like a shitty day, maybe they'll just take a car. Is it Councilor Hanson, do you have your hand back up? Yeah, I was just going to respond quickly to um, Mark and I guess Kelly too. I think, um, and you know, any of the strategies that we're going to talk about with the parking management plan, none of them we do we know that they're going to influence behavior, right, in that way. But I, I feel like this one is as certain as any of them in terms of like we're going off of 
what happens in other examples when you do this strategy and also the survey data, what did people say? Like those are kind of the two things we're going off of. And I feel like this is as much as any of them, you know, this is indicating that. Okay, thanks. Then let's move on. And John, I'm just gonna interrupt. I, I just wanna to acknowledge to the public that I, I see your hands in the Q and A in the chat. So thank you for all that. We'll gather all this and address things uh, as we get to the next public comment section, and and maybe this next uh, discussion will help address some of um, what you're um, asking here. Great, thanks, Brian. All right, so the task at hand, we're going to go segment by segment. We're looking to get consensus on priorities for time periods. So by user group is the way that we've thought would be a helpful way to organize this. And the user groups are the ones that generally align with the survey, meaning are they residents, are they visitors, are they employees, are they business owners? And so we understand how each of them have different needs for parking and they're each affected by different strategies uh, differently. And so our goal is to identify applicable strategies that the technical team are gonna then refine is that the, we just need some guidance to say, are there any, any strategies that are off limits? And then which ones, are of, of worthy of, of more detail. Uh, so to give us a sense, Riverside Archibald again, remains in very high demand, highly utilized, low turnover if unmanaged, uh, that's Riverside. And so do we wanna propose anything for Riverside? Uh, the current management along North Winooski is gonna continue to work. It's a one hour period that's open to residents at night. And based on the forecast, the, the current residential demand doesn't overwhelm that and it seems to work well with the current commercial use. Those are the, my observations from, from the occupancy data and the modeling. And so now we have an opportunity to say, what do we wanna do? And we have kind of the overnight period, uh, then we have the morning and midday, and then toward the afternoon and evening is kind of the framework that we have for us. And these colors are just simply meant to give us the kind of classification differences. Uh, these were meant to be kind of an initial seed to sow the discussion with. And so to orient us real quickly, because they almost all look very similar to this, is that the idea that maybe overnight, residents should have the ability to park on the street. Um, and then the second priority is visitors, third priority is, is employees. Then during the middle of the day period, and assuming that the one hour time period exists today and will remain in the future, there clearly is a priority toward the visitors and the commercial users today. Do we want to maintain that? And then there's kind of the residents after that 6 p.m. time period. Employees are the lowest priority. They don't have any ability to park really uh, in that corridor because they typically are there probably more than one or two hours a day. And then in the evening, we kind of see the same thing as the overnight. So here's some ideas. The management strategies are in the top right, just to remind us. Uh, what do we need in the overnight time period to meet the goals of, of the parking of the businesses of the entities around here? Uh, what do we need during the middle morning in the middle of the day? What do we need in the evening? Uh, I think hopefully if we kind of exercise this one example, we'll be able to kind of move a little bit fast through some of the other sections. Uh, at least that's my hope. But does anyone want to uh, kind of kick this off? Do we, is it, is it easier maybe to think about the middle of the day? If we're losing the right hand for parking, which is currently two hours, um, and it's going to be one hour on the other side of the street, what are the management strategies that we're going to need to support the, those, those entities? Kirsten, you have your hand. Sure. So I'm just going to say one hour parking doesn't really work for employees no. at all. That's right? why the third tier. Right? Right. Yep. So that's how I'm going to start with that. <laughs> I don't see how that works for employees. And so they currently that makes me very concerned, particularly for the health center and others. Um, the health center has a lot, is a large employer and provides really critical services to this community. And they have some parking on site and it, they split that parking on site 50% for the, for employees and 50% for their clients who are coming. But that said, and then they rotate monthly, which employees get to park on site. So everybody bears their share of figuring out the other th how, how else to park or to arrive or get to work. 
and I just worry that, you know, people were, you see people leaving the healthcare field, you see that it's a difficult field, particularly in the pandemic, not that it's easy at any time. And I worry about what we're doing to the services that are really critical for the people in the neighborhood. And are we going to be impacting those? And I, I fully believe that the, the health center has that same concern. Um, you know, they, 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 last year they had over 55,000 visits in the pandemic. Can I, can I ask here, so do you think some of that one hour parking should be opened up for a longer time frame for employees? We heard earlier that the need for visitor parking was really crucial for that. So trying to just think about how we're going to well, it's it's a mix. It's a, visitors or or their clients. So maybe it works for more for people if if you only need an hour for your appointment. But that's still pretty tight for an appointment. You know, you get there, you go. I don't know. Maybe you're in and out. It, it really depends on what services you're receiving when you when you go there, and are they running on time? And you know, how we all experience going and going and getting our medical care these days. So. I just, I'm not sure what the right answer is here. Maybe if I can maybe start with one of the questions before we get into the, like those specific strategies that we think about the user group priorities. Um, do you think that employees should be at a higher tier than uh, any of the other users for any portions of the day? Perhaps during the middle of the day, maybe residents. I, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. And um, oh, thanks for that from the health center. Yeah. It's good to know. Um, Thank you. So, yeah, I'm curious from the rest of the committee. Um, we, because this is exactly the kind of feedback that we need. And then, if we want to shift employees to a higher priority during the daytime, um, we can consider that. I find it hard to prioritize any of those because it's a public right of way, and you know you kind of want people to be able to use it. So, yeah, but I, well, I'm sorry, John. I'll let you chime in after this. The, oh, yeah, uh, you I, know, I, one of our main tasks here is yeah. defining the essential parking needs so that we can come up with the right strategies. And so, unless we can define the users that have those priorities and the essential needs and we're going to be really really uh stressed to find the right strategies yeah i was just going to chime in there sorry that there's currently a priority today and that's what really this is represented on slide that employees can't park there really realistically and so that's where they're showing up as the third tier and so to nicole's question do we see that we should shift? And, and really we're trying to not hone in on that, the details to say, all right, it's gonna be two spaces for employees, X number for, for visitors. If, if the committee feels that we need to elevate the employees, then the task is, all right, how, how, does that, how is that done? So that's what we need to hear. Yeah, Councilor Hanson, I think, just jump in here right now. I think that's fine for the committee. Yeah. Yeah, so the so in this stretch, the parking that's being eliminated is two hour parking, right? Correct. Yeah. So I I feel like that's what we should think about in terms of management is okay. What you know, what are we losing, and what does that impact? So I feel like that impact is not really on employees as much because they wouldn't be using two hour parking unless they're like jumping out of work every two hours, but. Um, so I think we should try to hone in on more so um, the visitors. I don't know, residents, I thought there were only a handful, right? And do they not have off-street parking? There was like only a handful of residents on that block, right? Yeah, only a handful. They don't have a ton of off-street spaces, uh, but they currently operate it, from the observations that we have, they keep, they seem to operate fine once they have available parking after 6 p.m. Okay. So yeah, I don't, uh, I guess I'm not as worried about that. I'm not really worried about residential during morning, midday, but I think what we're, what the impact is, is more on the visitors then. Yeah, 
because it's that two hour that you're losing. So I feel like that should be the priority. Okay. Everybody agree that visitors and the commercial users are the priority during the middle of the day, at least number one priority? I agree with Jack, yeah. I agree. Yes. Okay. Uh, let's just, I think going through it in the sequence works. Let's just say overnight, residents, that makes sense? Yep. Saying nods, yeah. Okay. Yes. I'm looking at the screen, by the way, so that's why I can okay. see if people have their videos on, I can see that. <laughs> uh, then, and, and the evening, so after, let's say, 6 or 7 p.m., um, is, it, is it a residential preference that currently exists today? Does that exist in the future? So I don't agree with that. And one of the reasons I'm I don't, I don't support a residential parking permit or residence after six only. In the bus barns um, project that we have, we have both commercial and we have, um, we also have residential in that location. And there is some off street parking associated with that, but three of the businesses located there are hospitality oriented businesses and they are busy and open after 6 p.m. And so that gives me a concern. We want them to be successful. Their success allows Champlain Housing Trust to continue to operate the property in a way that we're able to maintain it, keep it up. And it allows for certain types of um, uses to happen in the neighborhood, you know? And so thinking about goods or services that are important to people to use in the neighborhood that they can actually be successful and remain along the corridor is pretty important in my mind. So can I hear you that basically the unmanaged approach that exists today that allows anybody to park there after 6 p.m., that, that's a good, something that you think works. It leaves it open, equal access. Well, I'd like to hear from some of the other committee members about their thoughts about what I said and how they feel say? about parking along this area. Councillor Barlow and Jim. Uh, how many spots are on this block? That would be helpful for me also to understand how many parking spaces <laughs> would be lost in each of these. Well, this one, there's oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, one I, section. I'm sorry if the information's available. I just didn't know. Oh, that. it's available, but uh, okay. I'm going to have to go get it. So and continue and the conversation. I don't want to impede the problem. It's 22. You're removing 22 spaces, I believe, from this section. Thank you. I think that's correct, but you can... Verify. I will jump in and say, Kirsten, so Old Spokes Home is in the bus barn, um, and uh -huh. we do have that lot of spaces, and we've noticed just like this past week or so, like it's been insanely busy, like busier than usual in that lot. Um, so I can understand wanting to have that street parking later, and also, I mean, those spaces. I mean, Old Spokes closes at six, but you have Fo Hong, which is like a local business, local restaurant, and also people use the laundromat later than six. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really good point to leave it open, especially in that section of the corridor where there is a lot of usage going into the evening, um, kind of leaving it open to keep it sort of equal access, I think it's the best, uh, best option. 18 spaces is what we've had on that street section. Yeah, I would agree. I don't I don't think it should be made. I don't think it should be made residential only. Okay. So unmanaged until a certain time and probably, you know, it's just let residents take over once the commercial uses end for the day. And you can strike RPT as the strategy. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Let's switch. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so this is helpful. I think this is good. During the middle of the day, uh, with visitors, commercial. Now the question that just comes at second priority. Kirsten is suggesting that <coughs> employees should be elevated. Uh, they currently are only one hour restricted or two hour restricted, so they're basically not not parking there today. If you want employees to be number two, we're going to have to do something longer than uh, than a one or two hour. Parking. 
And yeah, we heard from Councilor Hansen with a different perspective. So yeah, anybody else from the committee, if you have other thoughts on the priorities here for midday. Jack, for the second tier priority in the middle. Yeah. Yep. Well, oh, sorry, we're Mark, are you going there? No, I just wanted to clarify. So yeah, I mean, I guess I would think employees should be second after visitors and commercials. And I guess it doesn't have to be all or nothing, right? Like today it's all one hour, two hour, but it could be, you could have some 15 minutes, some 30, and then like a couple employee spots potentially, right? In the future. Yeah. You could have a couple uh, unmanaged or all day or a brown meter and somebody could park there all day, for instance. Um, so if, if employees would be number two, then there's a variety of things that we can do. Okay. Uh, do we see a need for commercial loading spaces? I think they, I think they pull off off street right now. I don't think there's any, I'm trying to recall if there's a commercial zone. Uh, we can maybe, does anybody have an idea that, that uh, commercial loading is critical here? It's a short term commercial loading space, for instance, you know, 30 minute with commercial loading or 15 minute, that can also happen quite often. Yeah. Are you guys incorporating this, what the survey said into your initial draft? Like, cause I don't, I feel like the survey could give us insight into the demand for commercial loading or whatever, or any of this stuff. We know if they've given us an address, which is optional, <laughs> but we know where their loading uh, would be desired. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Okay. Not everybody gave that information. I, yeah, and I would say maybe instead of yeah getting into the weeds on that specifically, we'll just follow up with any commercial entities at the so when we do do a commercial loading zone though then that it will it be dual purpose like so it might be loading for a certain period of the day and then at a different period of the day maybe it becomes parking because if you have commercial loading that has to be big enough for a truck to get into so you're really seeing not just the loss of the 22 spaces but if if you when you do place commercial loading along the corridor then you're further restricting sort of uh, the availability of, of parking to individual normal size vehicles. Yep. So. Um, I just have to ask quickly and then we're gonna move on, but in terms of pursuing other off street locations, are these, are these things off the table? Uh, sorry, I'm highlighting off the street capacity. I, I do put, I put an address here. Clearly we have not talked to anybody about this and it's not uh, not available spaces as far as we know, but there's a large surface area there outside of that building and along Riverside on 6 Riverside. Uh, is, this, is this something that is worthy of at least for more spaces? Should we, look into this and say the city should investigate remote lots or the city should look at pursuing eventually finding some parcels is this a recommendation that we want to make yeah i could just jump in here um i think this could address one of the comments one of the recent comments pretty well um in terms of employee parking and those who do need to use on street spaces currently uh throughout the day i think for people such as employees who are staying in the area for longer periods of time, um, considering remote lots such as the North Winooski one, it would definitely be a good option for parking spaces for them and then a short commute, walk or bike um, into work from there. So I just want to say that, oh, I'm sorry, um, I just want to add, so CHT owns that property and I did talk to our property managers about that. And you know, we, we actively have residents as well as the businesses that use a portion of the, the parking there. And it is subscribed in its entirety um, in terms of we, we have to have certain amounts of parking spaces for our residential units. Um, and 
our other one of our other buildings a little further down in the corridor, which I'll talk about at the time, actually has absolutely no parking associated. It was really one of the things the city had asked um, the housing group to come and look at one of these older buildings, a corner store, and along the corridor, and we and they did, and it was redeveloped. And but the lot itself is the building is the lot, so they rely strictly on street parking, and there's no way for us to fix that for them. So. Um, I would like to know if that's a real thing for people or not. Does the city have money? Are they buying land? Is there actually land to be had where you could create these remote lots? How remote away would they be? Like, and would people use them? I mean, those are things like, if they're not real, we shouldn't, <laughs> then I don't think you, I don't think they can be part of the solution if they're just not real. And if they don't have the money to be real, then they're just not real. Right, Max is, I mean, I think it's, that's a fine comment. I don't think it's worthy of conversation right now because we don't have those implementation strategies or a budget in mind. So I think from, from us now is that a far, far off kind of future that might be, might be of interest to explore, but it's clearly not an option for the next immediate time. Yeah, I guess I would just add that, right, it's, it, I would say it's not a viable option for the near term. However, the city will never allocate the funding if it isn't identified as a priority and if it's um, not something that seems important. So I guess like from this committee, if this seems like a strategy that is extremely important for this project and to offset the impacts here, then that is something that the city needs to hear so that we can try to find the funding. Well, then I, I would say that new off-street capacity is the number one priority. I would have to agree. If that's a possibility to look into, we should definitely pursue that. It would make this a lot easier. But I still, even by saying that, I, I don't see how it's a reality given the land uses around there. So I just, I know you don't want to talk about that now, but <laughs> it may come up again. Sir yeah, I was going to say, I think it should be more so just because, yeah, I don't think it's super realistic either that there's some, that someone's going to build a new parking lot in that space, but um, trying to identify like existing off street parking that could be remote parking um, that isn't already full. Cause we know from not only this study, but a lot of the broader study of parking in Burlington that there's tons of off street parking that isn't full, but it's, that was part of why we changed zoning to unrestrict that because previous to the zoning change, that park that the all of that unoccupied parking couldn't even be shared but now it can at least in the transit corridors so that opens up tons of spaces that aren't currently utilized all right i am um now i'm worried about time <laughs> yeah <laughs> so we have a lot of people from the public we have to be uh, mindful of what we've promised, I guess, in terms of uh, more comments there. So I uh, want to figure out the best way to. Uh, this is the next section down, Archibald the Union. It's oversubscribed. Uh, there is there is a lot of uh, business activity in this section. It clearly not a ton of residents that are using the area today. And so it's probably going to be employees who are the most affected as well as visitors to the, to the, there's also a fair amount of off street parking. So I'm also, it's just the amount of intensity of the demand, but I think to be honest, Jack, to your point, this section probably represents some opportunities for some of the sharing, particularly some of the back lots and some of the bigger lots where they're currently uh, reserved to a set of users. So here's, if we just maybe dial into the middle of the day period again, uh, do we think that it's visitors and commercial uses should be the, the number one priority? Yeah. Take that as a yes. Okay. <laughs> and then the question is, right now it's unmanaged completely. 
it's first come first serve. It's somewhat low turnover in, in some cases because people come to park and work. Do we uh, do we install some time limits or other restrictions? Yeah, so just an, another, I guess, clarifying question. I don't know if you understand it or not, but do employees park? There's parking on the street now. So where would they park if they were displaced? Would they park in the lot associated with businesses there? I mean, that way I think we need to understand that. We, we don't know to that level of detail because uh, we were not able to do a, an intercept survey, so to speak, to understand, try to say, hey, you, you're parking here. Why can't you go park in your off, lead, off, lot, off, off street lot? We do know that there are some businesses that do not have adequate parking for their employees nor visitors. We know that across the whole study area, about 55% of the employees park on the street. So there is a likely chance uh, a fifth, out of the total nature of who's parking on the street, employees is somewhere probably around 35% of the overall mix of people on the street. So if you're eliminating those spaces, about 30% of them are probably employees that are in that. Probably park on side streets or in some cases, they might work out negotiations with their current tenants, or they might mode shift, all those kind of things. And you said right now it's totally unmanaged there. That's right. In this section, again, I, I am most I am concerned about the impacts on the food shelf, again, with um, 12,000 visits. Um, annual visitors and 17 employees um, and then multiple delivery vehicles coming and going. So their entire parking lot cannot be used by visitors or employees because they have delivery vehicles coming regularly. So please think about that as we make our decisions. So the, the impacts of reducing the spaces here, which are already pretty full. So people are already parking on Union, Crombie, Decatur, they're probably parking on side streets. They're going down the section to the south, which is forecast to still have some capacity. Uh, so we don't know exactly where people are going, but it's not, uh, it's not the end of the world, is that basically because of how busy it is today, it's gonna remain very busy. And there's only a handful of people that are gonna have to shift their behavior in that section. Uh, so by putting in a parking limit, if that's a suggestion that I want to make, is that it will encourage faster turnover for at least the visitors of all those businesses and entities. And is two hours the right limit? Is it something longer? Uh, how do people feel about time limit parking on that section? Shouldn't it be, shouldn't it be shorter based on the uses? than two hours? We, we could also put a mix of shorter and- or I and guess, okay, yeah, because you have both options in there, yeah. Again, I'll just go back. We don't, we don't understand who the users are. I mean, we don't know if they're employees. If employees are getting there and par parking early in the day and staying there, um, there's not gonna be a lot of turnover. Those people would be displaced by any metered parking there. Um, and we just don't know. I mean, it's hard to make a decision when you don't understand the impacts. Yeah, it's it's a mix. And that's why we have only the data that we have, which is basically a, a lot of the employees, I think, in this section, given the amount of off-street parking, are parking off the street. I think it's mainly visitors in a short term and a handful of employees. That's basically what what we're estimating. We don't know. We, we know whether the, we, we know from the model, we can tell whether it's commercial users that are parking on the street. We don't know if they're employees or visitors. So we don't know that level of detail, but we know that there's a handful of commercial users parking on the street. Um, so yeah, it, it, we are limited, but there's always gonna be people adapting and changing to these things. Uh, you know, and one, one other question, I guess, is visitors to uh, the food shelf, would they, you know, they, they may not want to pay for meter parking. And this doesn't have to be metered. Time limits okay. can just it's be time. time. Be a time. Yeah. Okay, got it. Yep. Yeah. Uh, do we think that, uh, do we need any residential parking permit in this area at all? 
there's not a lot of residential demand um, and there's a lot of commercial demand, which probably dissipates at night. That's basically what we see. So we don't probably need to go through that process. I would say no. That. Uh, in the evening, uh, if we have unmanaged spaces or time limits until 6 p.m., I don't think, do we need to say, is it residents or visitors? Basically at 6 p.m., again, it's equal access. Well, what I have something we've been like honing on 6 p.m. I don't think we know yet. What right, you don't know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, okay, sorry. Is it Current, evening? Yeah. Evening. All right. Are, are people generally uh, of the same persuasion as the North that basically the residential and the visitor needs in the evening are kind of equal in this section? Uh, Kirsten, on short-term parking for the uh, for the feeding chitnin, typical um, visit aside from employees is probably relatively short, thirty minutes or at least under two hours. Probably. They have volunteers also, yeah. and they do um, lunches and other items. So um, I, other 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 activities beyond simply food food distribution. Yeah, I mean, kitchen. Exactly. In that sense, like you come get a bag of groceries and leave, right? They do other activities as well. Uh, so at seven fifty, <laughs> we were forecast to be done in ten minutes. We were going to leave ten minutes for public comment. Uh, we have three more sections to go through here. I feel like we are. We're understanding what the task is. Is the committee able to spend another 15, 20 minutes after 8 p.m. if we give the public comment period 10 minutes right now? Okay. Yeah. I think people have waited and I, I'd like to hear what they have to say and, and how you're addressing their concerns. Okay, great. So uh, Brian, again, can you facilitate? Um, um, I'm just going to keep the screen as is, if that works. Yeah, or, uh, yeah. yeah. I can do that. And thank you, everybody, for your comments uh, and chats and your raised hands. Um, I'm going to start with the raised hands first, and then we'll go to uh, the, the question and answers. Um, Thomas. Hello. Uh, yes, I'm a resident on the North Street to Grant Street block, which we haven't heard about. And I very much suspect that your 5% of estimated total demand of parking spaces is going to be um, being lost, is going to be concentrated in our block. Our block has about 65 parking spaces and we lose half of those, that's 35. So I think the, the residential users who are going to be harmed by this scheme are concentrated on our block and it's um, those specific residents who are going to lose their parking spaces and they are not going to be helped by any of these high in the sky remote parking schemes. I don't think there's a lot of spare capacity elsewhere in Burlington and I just want to point out that it seems to me that in this process the needs of the residents of Burlington are, and business owners um, who reside in Burlington um, are being deprioritized um, concern. And you seem to be more concerned with the needs of people who don't live in Burlington and want to cycle north um, towards Wainuski. Um, they can already do this, of course, because there is a bike park on Grant Street. So I don't understand what need um, this change is, is helping, how the residents of Burlington are benefiting from this change. And it seems like they are uh, really going to be um, suffering from, from this change. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you. Um, Kara, you're up next. Hi, thanks everyone. Um, my name's Kara Greenblatt. I'm also on the same block uh, between North and Grant. 
Um, just a, a couple points on the, the numbers again. Um, you talked about the um, that our block has about 60% um, usage of spaces, 63%, I think, was the number in the report. And then the moderator or the presenter um, talked about 50% use of spaces at night and asked for some feedback on that. Um, I have no idea where that number, where either of those numbers could come from. I'm, I'm really concerned that the, that the data that you're using for modeling is not accurate. Um, if you come over here tonight and count the, the number of empty spaces be, on our block, you would not come anywhere near 50%. It would be more like you'd find a space or two after driving around the block several times. And, and I, as I said earlier, I do have to drive around the block several times, um, more than one night a week to, to be able to find a spot to come home to and, and sleep at my house at night. Um, so those numbers, I just can't imagine they're accurate. Um, I also just wanted to say that, uh, I guess I, I, because it is the highest density block, I'm hoping that you can come up with a solution that considers that and that gives um, you know more access to if you're going with remote lots or whatever you're going with um, gives extra um, attention to to the residents on this block. Um, and I'll I'll just say I'm I'm also you know listening to you go through block by block each of these sections of the corridor and and finding it you know your group finding it very difficult to prioritize users. Um, which I understand. I wouldn't want to have to prioritize between employees and people who are sick trying to visit a health center or people who are volunteering at the food shelf on, on the corner here. Um, at what point do we go back to the beginning and say, is this necessary? And at what point do we relook at the point that was made earlier? Why not improve the infrastructure we have for bikes? We have infrastructure that works and that needs extra promotion, it needs repairing, it needs help during the winter, um, instead of pushing through something that at every turn seems to um, uh, have, have challenges and barriers. Um, I, don't, I, I just can't imagine how we're going to go forward with this. And could someone um, tell me at what point do we reconsider the, the, original, um, the original plan of putting this in? Um, lastly, I just wanted to ask if there's any way at all, if this does go through, um, that there could be a way of first ensuring that a management plan is effective and actually works before you remove these spaces from our corridor. Um, it, because I don't trust the numbers, I want to see that we actually will have spaces and, and that we will have you know, a way to come home at night and put our car someplace safe. Um, before the spaces are actually removed. I hope that makes sense. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. Um, Liz, uh, I see your hand is raised. I know you also had a lot of comments, so I will unmute you. Hi there, I am coming on as Brian using Liz's computer. So I am okay. Brian, Brian Pine and I'm speaking as, as a citizen um, who cares deeply about these issues and has lived in the old North End for um, over 30 years. Um, I wanna just say you have somebody on your, on your committee who has expertise in doing this because I know this because I hired her to handle the North Street Revitalization Project and the way that we approached the North Street Revitalization Project was an incredibly grassroots, inclusive, community-driven process that really engaged the community in a meaningful way. And I'm afraid that this got a lot harder with Zoom. So I don't, I don't, I'm not intending to point any fingers. I'm just saying that I don't feel that this process has been anything close to what um, what CETO did in its um, in its heyday 20 years ago around North Street. And Kirsten, I think, should be. You should use her as a resource. I think the way she approached her task, which was huge, was to re revitalize the physical infrastructure on seven blocks from North Avenue to um, North Mooski Avenue. And the work was done in such a way that um, folks weren't left out, folks weren't left behind. 
Uh, we accomplished great things there. We didn't create dedicated uh, bike lane, but at the time, the philosophy was really a share the road philosophy, which uh, as a pretty avid biker myself, I'm not a winter biker, but I do bike pretty, pretty regularly, pretty religiously to get around town. I, I tend to think the share the road has worked pretty well, but I understand that there's a different philosophy. And we could probably debate that quite a bit. But I, I have to say at the public meeting that happened, the first big public meeting at the Neighborhood Planning Assembly pre-COVID, um, I threw out an idea which got a lot of support, although perhaps some viewed it as not realistic. But I think it's as realistic as the idea that we're going to get satellite lots to handle remote parking. I, don't, I think that's actually really far-fetched. I think a more realistic idea is to look at the corridor and see if we can't accommodate both and not either or and i still think that's worth taking a closer look at is can we fit a good dedicated bike lane and parking and i know we have to give up something maybe it's the tree belt i think it probably is but i think we have to look at that rather than just assume that we have to work with the roadway that we have from curb to curb that we have today so i just want to ask you to think about this in a little bigger way and in a way that really does build the, I mean, the neighborhood, the neighborhood was really a priority for, um, for the residents of the neighborhood, for the elected officials, for the city, for, for really decades, because it was, the, it, it was the location of lots of speculation and blight and uh, brownfields and all of this incredible work was done to bring the neighborhood to a whole different level. So what you see today is not just like happenstance. That was very, very intentional. And I worked very hard to save a bunch of buildings in that neighborhood, ensure that we get the properties cleaned up in my job at CEDO many years ago. And I just wanna say that I think, I think we have some incredible assets here in terms of the organizations that are located there. It's like, a, it's an incredible hub. And I know with the restaurants, we have incredible activity and, and the neighborhood I think really appreciates that. And I worry that we're, we're thinking of, of ways to approach this that, that may in fact, we may look back on and say, we really did make some mistakes here. And I really want us to be careful about that. So please consider the both and approach, not the either or. Thank you. Great, thank you for that. Okay, um, next I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to the Q and A. And does everyone um, on the committee have access to those as well? Or is it just me? I have access to the Q&A. Well, you're a co-host. I don't I'm know. co-host, right. I can see them. Are, are you going to go through and answer these now? Uh, I think that might be a process question for the group. Um, okay. A lot. So let's see. Question. Uh, me. Yeah, so Nicole, do you want to go? Or some of these will be quick. I'm trying to see if there's any order to these. Um, are we at the top? Uh, time. Uh, trying to scan through and see which ones are. Well, I mean, I guess maybe I will just pose a question that rather than go through and read all of these, that um, if anybody who did take the time to add them into the chat, uh, if we haven't answered them already, um, maybe if you could just raise your hand and we can make sure we flag those and get to these because yeah, there are quite a few in here and if we've already answered them. I don't, we're already running late, so I don't want to keep us later. So Nicole, I think yeah. just we could probably just scan through a couple of these are pretty quick. Like that first one, just I think to be clear, the council has voted to put in the bike lane. Uh, so that's a yes. As far as I can tell at this point in time, that's the plan that's going forward. And the point is, is that the, uh, the idea is that within the current confines of the curve, uh, that's the plan. And so that's why this management plan is trying to manage the existing supply that will remain after that goes in. So that's the answer for Chris and a few others. Um, uh, The, uh, the parking model, there's, there's a, if everybody wants to go back on the July meeting goes into a lot more detail into terms of the parking model. 
And it is just a model. It's using national parking data for various land uses. And there was 40 different land uses that we put into the model. And it's based on national data, again, that we try to calibrate to the local conditions. But no, no data, trip generation or parking estimates reflect every unique land use that we have. And so, no, it doesn't explicitly account for the 1,200 visitors to the food shelf, but it does estimate the typical parking demand for a, 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 a we, I think we cut it as a, as a grocery store slash office. So I don't know how much parking demand that, that estimated, but we can always go into those details. And that's all in a pretty thorough draft report that's, that's been drafted um, and, and in a state of draft. Uh, uh, is anybody suggesting parking meters toward the health center? Uh, at this point, it sounds like just just time limits will remain as being the, the kind of the philosophy that was being put forward. All right, so the fifty percent occupancy at night between Grand and North. I agree. The mark the parking model underestimates. The observations that we had showed that it was seventy percent or more, and. And the July model, the July conversation goes in a lot more detail there. But the, the assumption is, is that there's people that's coming from outside of the study area that are, that are not reflected in the parking model. The parking model has a very defined boundary and there are some areas that are not reflected 100%. But what it does show is that clearly in the absence of uh, the removal of some of that parking, that demand increases and so it's forecast to be basically be a peak throughout the uh, all the time periods, all the from anywhere south of North Street. You're uh, you're moving it too, so <laughs> I'm hiding the ones we've already answered. Okay, uh, that's why it's moving. Yep. Right. And I do see um, Liz posted further down that um, her questions and comments were for the committee to consider, not necessarily for us to um, go over tonight. Okay. And John, were you saying I was moving them or Nicole was moving these? Uh, Nicole was, was taking us on the answer. Okay. I'm leading them. Sorry, I'm trying to yeah. figure Got out. It. Yeah, I'll stop touching it so you can scan it, John. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, there are a lot of questions or comments here just about specific kind of behaviors that are detailed behaviors that that are not assessed in the detail that 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 some of the uh, questioners would like. So some of that will be in the report, some will be in the narrative, and then there's there's some answers that we just cannot get to that re resolution with. There's gonna be a reduction in parking and we have to try to work with that. Um, okay. The, uh, there's an interesting one about street cleaning and, and how that forces a turnover at night. Um, that's for the committee to consider whether, I, I guess we don't really have that active of a management plan here in the city for, for street cleaning, but that would force uh, a certain behavior. We may have All right, I think that's it. Yep. So are we going to finish going through the sections? Because I feel like we owe it to the people on the other southern side of North Street. Yeah, let's, let's do it. Can we do it? Are all the questions and all the chat? Are we done, Brian? Public comment? Uh, I'm scanning the chat, which is separate from the Q&A, to see. Um, and thanks to Ellen who provided some some data on the health center and some other input that's uh, appreciated um, regarding appointment times and, and spaces. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, 
I, I guess I would like to propose, I know we're short on time, but I know that people stuck on the on the Zoom and I, I wanna be fair to getting through there. I also am not sure if we need to have like another public comment at the very end. I just wanna, so let, let it, can we, should we, shall we proceed forward and then reserve the opportunity if people feel like they have additional comments that are pressing? Yeah, and I'll also mention that our next step after this is to go to the Ward 2-3 NPA, so there will be a whole other opportunity for different comments there. But yes, I do agree that we keep moving on so we can, yeah, try to see what we're taking to the NPA. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Public Onward. Around, and then thank you to the uh, committee. Let's press on. All right, so the next section heading south here is the Union, union to Decatur um, intersection, Union Street to North Street section. The supply of parking is not forecast to change in, the, in this scenario. And basically, we're forecasting that the demand will increase because of the changes surrounding it. And basically, the demand might exceed the 70% kind of on the peak periods. So it's going to go from kind of that 50, 60 average up to 70 to 80 percent and that's when clearly management is typically um, is typical and by meaning management that means that maybe time limits maybe more more active uh, restrictions like pricing so with that uh, with that awareness that probably there's going to be some behavior uh, and probably those people shifting are probably visitors or employees how does this change the middle of the day philosophy now? What would be our number one priority? Councillor Hanson, I would just jump on in. Feel free to. Yeah. <laughs> I, so I thought you, I thought you all had said that it was usually 85 was when you needed to come in, 85%. 85 is definitely the rule of thumb, uh, Councillor Hanson. That is, that is correct. So, so if this if this is going from 60 to 70, do we need to, isn't that fine or? Yeah, so what I would probably recommend then is that it's probably a more uh, monitoring situation that if the demand starts exceeding that 85% for more than about three or four hours at a day, then a more active management regimen should be considered. So that's one way to go about it. Yeah, because I don't think we should push because everything we do on each block affects other blocks. And if this one's at 70, we shouldn't push people out to other blocks, I don't think. Because I mean, yeah, this block's not losing parking, so. If this block doesn't lose parking, does that mean the bike lane that, that you're gonna put, that, that supposedly is going in is gonna be disconnected? No, it has enough width in that section. So this section can accommodate parking on both sides plus the bike lane. Yeah, this little graphic here. It has a wider curb to curb than other parts of the section, uh, the corridor. Which I guess I'll also just mention because this is right on the cusp of feeding Chinden, which has been a you know big conversation point. Um, so that this block will also be able to accommodate some of that parking. They're right on the corner. Right. Right. So today, overnight, it's just general unmanaged. So frankly, you know whether we have a priority or not, it's it's the way I'm gonna. What I've heard is that if if we're leaving it unmanaged, it's an equal priority, frankly. Uh, and then the question will be, right now, there is a very short-term space at, at, at the corner of Crombie, and so that will be remaining there. So in terms of the commercial needs, they probably have that, but um, during the evening and the overnights, we probably are fine to leave it equal. And then during the middle of the day, if we leave it unmanaged as well, we'll monitor the demand. So is that... Um, I assume that all, like, 15 minute or commercial loading spaces that are already along the corridor or handicapped spots that would probably be remaining where they are? For, for this section, all of it would be untouched is basically what we're suggesting right now. Okay. All right, let's keep going. Uh, so this section here, 
I think we've heard a lot about it from the comments and it as mentioned is that we basically see the existing occupancy is somewhere during the 75 to 80% during the, during the middle of the afternoon and then basically going to a full most of the day. And that's with the change in that supply on the Eastern side. There's a number of units that have very limited parking. And then there's a few that have a, a fair amount on the back. Uh, it's been observed that probably some of that demand is showing up from points south because of the meters that are there. So now we have a situation where it's almost predominantly residential. How does this change the middle of the day priorities? Do we accommodate visitors and commercials that commercial users who might come from elsewhere? Because there's very few of those uses in this corridor. Or do we leave it unmanaged and just have really full up? Do we have time restrictions that it might be available for visitors and commercial uses until, until a certain um, until a certain time, do residents, maybe this is an opportunity for a, for a time of day that a RPP is applicable. I'd like to hear your thoughts. Max, just go for it. Yeah, so my understanding of this block, this is the block where I actually live. Um, it is mostly residents and I don't know every property exactly, but the, as you mentioned, there is a good amount of off-street parking already available. For instance, in our unit, um, it's 128 near the top, the north edge there. Um, we use about two or three spaces of the six available that we have in our backyard. Um, I know there is a lot of usage during the day on the street. At nighttime, there's not a lot of parking there um, <clears throat> that's taken up. So I think this could be an opportunity to kind of bump up the importance on employees maybe um, it might be a good spot for overflow if we maybe bump down residents i don't know if i'm wrong in saying that but as a resident of this corridor i think residents can almost be given the least priority um, with potential for overflow for employees from other from other sections and, that's, and that's just my thought is that a certain time of the day max I would say it's good for midday. Yeah. The section we're on now. So for those about, people that might be from out of town that need parking during the day. So let me just flesh that out a little bit more in the committee gets feedback. Do you think then uh, uh, what what happens just to the south or that there are a handful of the brown nine meter meters? Would that be an approach to, to uh, give those employees those spaces or leave it unmanaged like it is today? I wanna say that unmanaged would be a good option, kind of first come, first serve. Um, love to hear other thoughts on that, but that's what I would say. Cool. If it's unmanaged though, wouldn't, couldn't residents just kind of camp out there around the clock, kind of blocking out those other uses or? Yep. So, okay. Well, what, I mean, you all are the experts. <laughs> what do you, I, I agree with Max. So I think whatever we can do to achieve what Max is saying. Yeah, I mean, some sort of, whether it's meters or time restricted parking is going to help um, manage that turnover that you were talking about, Councillor Hansen, so that Residents aren't parking there all day if employees are um, one of the higher priorities here. Councilor Barrow? Um, I would just say that there could be, we know there'll be impacts in the next block we haven't talked about. Mm -hmm. There are businesses there I could envision, um, you know, visitors, commercial needing to park a little bit further away. Mm -hmm. um, so I would want to discount the downstream effects literally here in this case. So. We might want to bump the priority of visitors and commercial. Not for overnight, but for mid-morning, certainly, and maybe even, even evenings. Yeah. Okay, so I think from a practitioner point of view, if, if uh, Councillor Hansen's inviting opinion, I think to Nicole's point, and that if we're talking about visitors, 
who might not have sufficient parking down in the southern section, as well as managing employees. Again, it might be a mix of maybe more blue, shorter duration, either time limits for free parking with kind of a half an hour, one hour windows. And then clearly probably for the visitors, the best way to do it without, um, uh, to avoid the residential members camping out there is probably put a, a, a nine hour uh, brown meter. And because that's just to, to just further to the south, it feels like it's a, it's a price that people are willing to pay because that to the south is very in high demand all day as well. What time do those meters end? Because I want to be conscientious of what we heard from some of the the residents along. I'm not really sure which which Pearl. section here between North and Pearl, but right. uh, it's nine. finding finding. What's currently ninety six? Currently, the meters are ninety six. So that would mean open time after 16. That's right. Um, so the question sort of for Unicole, should, um, should this initially go forward with meters um, that end at six so that, that it's open for residents in the evening if, if residents were still struggling and really um, challenged in those circumstances, would there be the ability to come and petition the city for residential parking in the future? Absolutely, yeah, that can happen at any point. I mean, that's also something we can consider here. I mean, it could become residential parking at 6 p.m. and meters during the day. I don't know that we want to start, people don't necessarily want to jump into, you know, paying for the residential uh, passes all the time, but yes, that is definitely an option. I'm not a huge fan, but... So maybe, um, so here is a proposal that, do we wanna say there's a mix of shorter term, either, either uh, or paid parking. There's a handful of longer term paid parking and then kind of put a caveat there to say, if the parking is still too full after the meeting <coughs> RPP to be considered. available residents. So that's that's basically what I think it's what we're saying. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, to that comment about yes, overnight we are prioritizing residents. Yes. Actually it's be starting at 6 p.m. is <laughs> we're prioritizing residents. Yeah. That sounds like a good revision to me we have here. I agree, yeah. All right. So we're basically saying uh, it's employees, visitors are the, the first priority during the day, residential last or secondary. Uh, during the evening, after the meters or the time limits are done, then the residents get, whether, whether it's unmanaged or a dedicated RPP can be a decision. Uh, and then that will be overnight as well. So, okay. That's good. I heard that. Um, just gonna put sorry my own notes here. I know everyone else is taking notes. All right, the last section here is and much to uh, so we've said this is the second most dense residential area, over 105 households in it, with fewer than uh, 0.7 spaces off street. Uh, so this is somewhat just the flip side of the northern piece is that this one has a fair amount, a lot of residential demand with fewer spaces. It currently is actively managed during the day with meters and then available for anybody unmanaged at, after in the evenings. So that's what's currently happening now. And so in the future, do we see that changing in the middle of the day? Do we keep the meters as is? Do we try to encourage even a faster turnover? Is there any is there any indication that we want to change what's currently working during the middle of the day? Uh, 
I don't see any hands. So basically, we're just going to keep the existing during the middle of the day. Okay. Is that? I mean, is that what you all recommend? Or it's 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 a little more. It's a lot. It's a higher occupancy than what um, you know. The city's philosophy is, I think, it's called some, know, something smart parking or something, and uh, and it's it's exceeding that 85 percentile it's pretty close so basically it's a pricing piece at this point councillor hansen and the city wants to be generally consistent within the meters and the zones so it's um, i would say it's reasonably working fine right now you probably don't want to touch it just in this study okay thank you could, you could extend the blue ones a little bit more to get faster turnover because it's about split 50-50, blue and, and brown meters. But okay. I don't, I don't, I think I, I don't have a strong preference on terms of it's, blue versus brown. I don't think it can be residential parking 24 hours a day. Okay. Uh, and I, I think the mix of parking is good, even on both blocks to have short and long term. It gives people that flexibility and it might mix up the parking rather than just one block being all short, one block be, being long, for instance. All right. I think so have, oh, one more thing, I think just it is important definitely to include um, some of the short term high turnover parking just because it is closer to downtown. So. Do you think that maybe a recommendation that that there might be some more 15 minute because of the food um, operations there and pick up drop off type of operations? Is that something to consider and, and flesh out whether there'd be two very short term spaces or something? I think there may be. I mean, from my personal experience, I was a DoorDash driver the past two years. That is a super congested area. Um, it's a pretty common stop. I've seen four pickup drivers there at the same time before um, on the south end of that block um, all the way towards Pearl Street. So maybe one or two short stops there would be a good consideration. I will say that basically the loading zone that's in front uh, of the buildings on the on the on the radio beat side, that loading zone is there and that's what you probably use for the drop off right now and pickup. Mm -hmm. That will have to be eliminated and shifted to the other side of the street. And basically, there's enough room right there uh, because of the way the travel lanes are configured to, to put that in the in the lower west side of the street. Yeah, from my experience, that's actually where most of the delivery drivers pull over is to that right side of the street as as they're driving down south. So. Is that workable for the rest the restaurants? Mm -hmm. They go. Right now, today, you see some of the big trucks. They pull on the right side of the street already. I've had photos of that. Couldn't we have a delivery drop-off, uh, a shared sort of use space there that would be both bike lane and delivery? I'm just saying that I know we, we there's other places that we've considered things like that. So, like up on um, Colchester Avenue, is there something like that by where the cars would cross? I guess it leaves the bike lane open still. I'm just I think we can be creative here too. Look at that for Nicole to consider. Yeah, right. it, it's a, <laughs> That's the bike lane design part of the project, less than the yeah, okay. <laughs> parking management. Yeah. But aren't, aren't, didn't you just say we could have, in fact, the loading space on even on the, with the bike lane? Councilor Barlow was suggesting keeping it on the. Oh, on the other side. Oh, well, just, yeah, but, I, but to Max's point and, and yours, um, John it's already kind of happening on that oh. side as well. I think that the point is taken. So when that, those details get looked at, I think there's some engineering suggestions to avoid that, that particular type of conflict, but uh, I, all no, I, I don't think it's necessary though. I, I, to, I don't think what Councilor Barlow is saying is necessary. I think the loading zone is essential, but it seems like it can be on that that other side. I guess I would defer to the rest of the businesses there and uh, presume that we could be experts on that here. Right. So in the evening, I just meant because today, because like that's already the case. That's that's why I was saying that. Okay. It's a de facto drop off today. 
Uh, in the evening, right now, the meters end at 6 p.m. and it's open access. Do we, this is such a high demand area, frankly, the meters could probably extend further, but there are a lot of residents here as well. So is this something that do we want to change the priority here? Currently it's unmanaged, so it's kind of equal priority in the evening and overnight. Do we want to be more explicit? Is this an opportunity? Is this area so intense? Do we need some more restrictions? Do we need an RPP? Do we, um, what, is there any thought here? And we can also let the residents partition this, is that we can leave it unmanaged as it is now and know, and just, um, and, and say that residents can petition this and say, this is clearly a, a, a high likely block for an RPP. Seeing some of the comments and knowing some of the conversations earlier and to Councillor Barlow's point um, on the last block, thinking about kind of the commercial spillover from removing meters on this block, then maybe we should think about kind of the same strategy for residents overnight for the spillover in the evenings um, of removing that one lane to, this, to give them more options to park on this block as well. So I know it doesn't necessarily solve the problem of the residential demand on this particular block, but this could be something to consider that basically it's a residential parking zone for those two blocks. Right, okay, so if I heard you right, currently today, it's unmanaged in the night, but because of the absence of parking on both this block and the block to the north, let's free up more space dedicated to residents. And so you're suggesting that the RPP might be something this committee would we, I, we don't have an endorsement, but I guess we do want consensus. Uh, is that something that this committee says, hey, we think RPP might be applicable here? Yes. I think I, it's worth. Sorry, yeah. Jay. Sorry, did someone else say something? No, I was reading a comment on the screen and getting distracted. Sorry. I haven't heard very much from Councilor Schomburg. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I mean, I. I think that's fine. So the RPP is, could you just describe the process of that real quick? Yeah, I'll let Nicole. Well, I mean, at this point, all we're asking is if this seems like a reasonable strategy to suggest, then we take it forward for more conversations with the community at the next NPA meeting. And if there is still a consensus that this is something that we should entertain, the process is that it, it is established by the Public Works Commission. It still has a whole other um, approval process and it would then require residents to get parking passes. Um, okay. And there's like, there's a whole structure around how many they can get, what the cost is. It's either a one year or two year permit. Um, but that's it in a nutshell, is that it is a permit that they put on their car or their visitor's cars that gives them the ability to park on that section of the street. Okay, yeah, that makes that makes sense to me. Um, and so I saw on like one of the earlier slides, it was the, the plan was to, I think, just finish out with the NPA of wards two and three. Are you gonna go to all of the NPAs on this or just, just for that ward because of that district? We were going by the council resolution that clearly pointed out we needed to go to this NPA. So we're only planning this okay. one. Okay, yeah, because I mean, obviously, like, I could, even my word isn't, yeah. Um, okay, that makes total sense. Sorry, thanks for the clarification. Thank you. I guess with that, I'd also say, yeah, I'm supportive of doing that. So, Kirsten. I think it should be something that's brought forward to the NPA. I guess in the next phase of this for their feedback, I guess. Uh, it's just another place also for um, people who have participated on this call, I would strongly encourage them to participate at, at each step as this proceeds. All right, so general consensus is that probably this is the appropriate corridor for an RPP to be brought to the MPA for further conversation. It, it is going to be a balance too because you've got a lot of businesses right there at the corner and it's very active into the evenings. So. Yep. yep. That is true. Um, all right. Those are the, those are the segments. The kind of questions that we just 
need to reflect upon. We have the goal of putting the bike lane in, meeting essential parking needs. We tried to define what those needs are by understanding who are the users who are using the corridor, how are they affected, and what opportunities do those users have to park elsewhere. Uh, there will be some areas of stress. Um, I want to be clear for the public that's still listening. We're not saying that this management plan is going to meet or provide the option to replace all that parking that's lost. There will be some impacts to that. And we don't have an answer for every land use or resident or visitor. Uh, so the question is, are we meeting those essential needs? Are we balancing that supply and demand? Uh, committee, are we, have we missed anything? Can we reflect quickly? Are there any little um, spots that require us to dig a little deeper and understand anything more specifically? Um, there was a public comment earlier that I thought was, um, it could be useful. Are there opportunities to pilot any segments to try to see what the, um, the shifts might be in, in terms of, of use or? I leave that, that, that's kind of in the city's discussion because the, the, the resolution is pretty clear that this was supposed to be already on the ground, basically. The, the bike lanes are supposed to be designed this year and they are being designed this year and they'll be part of the paving project. I think that'll be happening next year. You're saying if we can't answer some of these questions, that would give us more tools to sort of empirically see how things would play out in real, real life before we actually, um, you know, made those more permanent commitments. And it might help shape uh, the design in a way that would be better or less impactful to existing current use. I mean, I don't know. I'm just throwing it out there. Right. Like, I, I think, well, we need an answer for it. And so that thing yeah. just is. It, it, it's somewhat rhetorical because I know some of this work was done before I was on the council. Everybody tonight's talked as though this is this is happening. You know, it, we're talking about a a, park, a parking management plan, but what we're really talking about is how to limit the amount of impact. Uh, we're not, you know, that's what we're doing. We're trying to find a plan that will limit the amount of impact, but Part of that might be to try to be more iterative about it, even if it takes more time and come up with something that works. I share some of um, Jane Nodell's concerns about like, what are we gonna do? Some of these things could have downstream effects that we won't know. That could be like an employer decides, well, I don't know about parking. I'm gonna move my business to South Burlington where I have more parking or, or something like that. We don't wanna have that happen unnecessarily either. So anything we can do, even if it elongates the process, have a better final pro end product, I think is worth at least considering. It may not be practical, but we should at least consider that. This is the place to do that, I think. I don't know if anybody else thinks that. Yeah, you're, for one, Councilor, you're, you're on the council, you're on the two. You, you have an authority here that I, I'm only the, uh, the, the technical assistant. So I'm, I'm providing you the only comment that I have is that behavior does take time and doing pilots for parking is almost impossible because people will not have time to change their behaviors and nor will they have time to seek out other alternatives that may eventually exist. So that is a limitation to pilots for sure. Well, you're certainly the expert on these things, so you would know better than I what, what's practical and what's not. I know we piloted bike lanes and things like that, like out of North Avenue. Right. So, uh, Councillor Hanson, a comment? Yeah, I was going to say to your earlier question about just the over these three questions on the slide. I think we didn't really talk about transportation demand management from employers, which I think has been proven in Burlington and elsewhere to be a super powerful tool. And we've seen, you know, UVM, Champlain, other other employers like putting in TDM and actually driving down the number of people driving by huge margins and and getting people to and from their their locations without cars so I think that should be a piece of the puzzle is just you know helping employers utilize TDM um, but 
to Mark's, I mean, to what Mark was just saying, I think we, I want to be careful that we're not kind of just going back to the process that we already had. Because from 2018 to 2020, there was like an 18 month process of the North, or, you know, the Winooskiav corridor study. What are we going to do with this corridor? And there was a bunch of public meetings. There was an advisory committee like this one. And they went through that 18 month process and they unanimously made the decision. They unanimously recommended to the council this configuration for the corridor. And then it went to the city council. I think it went through too. And the council, what the council did is was approve that, but also added this and what we're living through right now, which is this, um, you know, this parking management plan process. And I think we've, we've, done more than what was laid out like the council just laid out basically presenting to the NPA we went above and beyond in terms of doing a large survey and kind of getting that data and bringing that in but to at this point to like go back to the I, I don't think it really is appropriate to kind of go all the way back to like that original 18 month process that already played out and I wasn't suggesting we do that either. Um, I was just suggesting that um, the notion of trying to model or, or put some do some things temporarily to see how it might influence behavior could be useful. Jonathan has, Jonathan has indicated that that might not work because we might not see the behavior soon enough. But I thought it was yeah, and like originally we did talk about Mark. We did talk about if it was on the ground for a year before the paving plan which was the original timeline that it would be on the ground this year and you would have a year of this thing actually on the ground before the state comes in with the repaving next year so then if if you see it on the ground for a year and you want to make modifications you can do that ahead of the state coming in but because of how slow and delayed this whole process has been and and the way that we've continued to miss deadlines we're now up against that that paving and so it's we don't really have that same luxury that we would have had on the original timeline. I just would like to add um, that I am not sure that it was actually unanimous by the other committee, <clears throat> but it was overwhelmingly supported, I will say that, um, to go forward. But through that process, there was a longer term option and one that was often discounted as too, um, too high of a goal for us to meet as, as a community, which was really to look at, again, um, adding the bike lane, retaining the parking, perhaps moving curb and changing the overhead utilities to allow for moving of the curb, to provide the width, to really create a corridor that had all of the things that were needed for this to be a thriving corridor, um, including parking, including sidewalks, including bike lanes. And I have to say with a, trans a transportation bill on the cusp of passing at, at, in Washington, DC, I, I have to say it may make sense to consider trying to think about can we have it all good point kirsten all right i want to uh, then just acknowledge that unless we have any strong considerations to the contrary that basically we've done um, our due diligence in trying to meet these these obligations of the goal and these questions. Uh, clearly, some of the narrative is going to be fleshed out as we define these. Um, the, the management strategies that you've articulated tonight, we're going to take and add a little bit more detail. And then clearly, we're going to go and get more feedback from the NPA, uh, particularly on the art on the residential parking park plans and, and such. Uh, so thank you. Um, we're going to and so Kirsten, I'm going to just say any other words from the committee and then we'll talk about next steps. I think, yeah, we should jump into next steps so that we can. Because there may be comments on I that. just want to say, I just want to say, I am not convinced totally <laughs> that we have balanced um, 
supply and demand and or met all essential parking needs for some some groups say what are the next steps <laughs> well I, I we want to know exactly which specific groups and see whether customized and more sensitive you know focused management plans can assist those so here's the next steps uh, that we have today's meeting we've we've covered a lot of ground we have some next steps we have some management strategies we've We've conveyed to publicly into the committee the results of the survey and how that's informed and the users that we have and the opinions that were, that were expressed. We're gonna then prepare for an MPA meeting with more narrative around those management strategies and, and we'll discuss about how much of the background do we, do we go over in that meeting. It's as Jack, excuse me, Councillor Hansen has said, this has been an 18 month progress that has culminated in this, rec in this, in this uh, recommendation. And now some management strategies to uh, to help mitigate the uh, the impacts of that. And then we'll be re preparing the draft report, which then will come to you all for comments, which will then go in front of the Public Works Commission and the City Council. So those are the next steps uh, that we have in front of us. So Kirsten, if I, I don't want to delay things uh, necessarily, but if there are any specific comments you want to air for the, for the group, if there's a specific population, if there's a specific user that you think can be, the, the, the treatment of those users can be improved with the constraints that we have, please let me know here, please let us know, or if it's a more specific email correspondence, um, something that we can discuss that I'm happy to. Um, I, I'll continue to share sort of additional information about what I know about the use and um, to try to help you get additional information on from either the health center um, and feeding Chittenden and maybe some others. Um, I think maybe one of the things, John, that we can we can look at too is you know you shared that early slide about you know the 39 parking spaces that are estimated to be unresolved without any of the management strategies. We haven't gone right. through the process of trying to figure out what that looks like applying some of the parking strategies because we weren't really sure what the committee wanted us to move forward with. Mm -hmm. So that definitely needs to be a next step and may help us better answer that question of like how close to the end of our goal there of meeting the essential parking needs. But yes, it's good to continue to bring up Kirsten. Well, I am done with the presentation. I, I assume at this point in time, we, we don't want to hand it off to the public. We're, we're, we're done or do we want to do one more round? I don't know if there's been any new questions or comments. Yeah, I'll leave it to the committee, but I would say, John, if you can end on the slide with our contact information so that People at least know how they can reach the project team if you would like to follow up with us directly afterwards. Um, but yeah, committee, we will leave it to you if you would like one more round of public comments or if we should close this today and use the MPA as our next round of public engagement. This is after all your meeting, we are helping facilitate. <laughs> um, may I just, so, are you saying doing another round of public comment right now or, or scheduling a, a time for specifically that? No, it's basically, do we wanna close out the meeting now or do we wanna let one more round of uh, public comments before we close it out? Um, hmm. I mean, I don't wanna, I don't wanna squash anyone's voice. So, I mean, I don't wanna say no to people who wanna speak, but I guess I would defer to other committee members. I'm, in, I'm indifferent. If there's people in the queue, I think I would like to, to hear them. I think we owe that to them. I think we might have said that we might have one more round. Yeah, so I guess maybe it's really are there any committee members that need to jump off because we just want to make sure we still have a quorum of committee members um, to keep going. I'm happy to stay if others are and hear from people. I can stay for a few more minutes. Okay. We'll stay.
All right, great. With those four, I think we can keep going. So, all right, Brian, why don't we do one more round? Um, if anybody has a final. So while Brian looks at that, I'm looking at the questions and just seeing if there are any other ones there. And uh, I don't think we have any new questions posed in the Q&A box. Okay. Okay, uh, so we'll jump to the raised hands. I see Thomas. Uh, you, you can unmute yourself and then you can talk. Thomas, are you still there? All right, welcome back to you. Um, Beth, you're up. Hi, thank you for taking my call. Just trying to get things set on my screen. Um, I wasn't able to hear the whole presentation, um, but I've been keeping up and paying attention for the last couple of months, at least. When I became aware of it, um, I thank thank you for making some extra time. I appreciate that you guys are staying late. You've been here for a while, and that the comments that you're hearing are from frustrated residents. So I have enough parking here at my house um, for us and for our tenants. I also want to say I'm a cyclist, um, and I also maybe uniquely used to be a bicycle courier here in town. If any of you remember like, Lightning Bicycle Couriers. So I worry a lot about bicycle safety, especially in this town, um, but I also worry a lot about my neighbors. And what I've seen in my time that I've been here is an incredible increase in the pressure on parking. More and more, there are cars parked across the driveway. There are more cars double parked. Um, and I don't see, a particularly significant increase in bike lane usage. And I know that this is not what you're here to decide. I understand what your assignment is, um, but I still think since you're giving me an opportunity to comment, I want you to, to hear what I have to say. I wish that you were taking the residents' concerns seriously, <clears throat> especially around, as you say, essential parking needs. From my perspective, um, in listening to at least the part of the presentation and paying attention, as I said before that, they really haven't been addressed. I've lived here in this house. I'm, um, I'm between North and Pearl. I've lived here for 24 years. My spouse has been here for 30. Um, and I guess in making a comment for, what, for whatever it's worth, because in all sincerity, it doesn't seem as though you're interested in what it's like here for residents around parking for, or, and it, it also doesn't feel like you're um, interested in making a recommendation to alter your course based on any of our feedback. Um, our feedback is really based on our actual parking needs. And it seems that your perspectives and what you're furthering is based on data or observations that aren't accurate. And using that simply um, perpetuates the problem that we have here. The city, I would say, maybe due to COVID, um, maybe because it didn't want to hear feedback. I hate to be um, paranoid, but didn't want to hear feedback about what, what our needs there are or whether or not there's sufficient um, room for parking. Um, that meaningful feedback that we've been trying to give you hasn't been heard. And I'm concerned that um, by not listening to it, you're not doing this right. And if you think that just doing what you're specifically charged to do is all you need to do, I, I guess I would recommend to, the, to you that you're doing it wrong. Calling it impact or stress, from my perspective, is insulting, it's disrespectful. Essential parking needs, um, I don't think they can be met if you're making decisions based on erroneous data, um, assumptions, that the idea that you can lose 36 parking spaces and not have an impact uh, are my neighbors, people who work all times of the day, you know, making assumptions about when residents are working is a type of bias. I know, I know the people who work around here work tremendously long hours at different times of the day and are coming and going. 
And I think it's not respectful to sort of lump them all in together. Um, Jack, you had said something about it's not, um, it doesn't make sense to restart the 18th month process. I think I think restarting it with the right accurate information and gaining residents feedback does make sense. And I would encourage you to consider going back and making that recommendation. So overall, I, I just, I want you to, to hear me say that I'm disappointed in this process. You can continue to uh, say that, that, that it was um, far reaching and that you got the perspectives from people, but we're telling you that you don't, you don't have it. And the information that you have isn't correct. And it's, it's incredibly dis disappointing. And it's also really insulting. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Uh, all right, uh, Thomas, if you're still there, I see your hand up, you're welcome to talk. Otherwise, that's the last hand I see. So are we able to um, basically move our consensus? Are we have a, a quorum here to close this, this meeting? And we'll be preparing some documentation as we approach the NPA. And so we'll be in touch with the committee as that, as that uh, approaches. OK. Thank you also for all the all the hard work you put into this. Okay? <laughs> Even though you're taking a little bit of criticism, I, it's incredibly detailed. Like, part of the job, but uh, it's I always strive for for detail. And so uh, Beth, obviously, if you can hear me, send us along any specific points that you uh, that you're curious about, and always want to try to understand. We understand things the best we can. So thank you all. Um, committee, any last words? No, thank you. Thanks, everyone. When's the NPA meeting? Uh, we have to reach out to them to get on their calendars, hopefully in November is what we're aiming for. We will, we will let you know as soon as we get it scheduled. All right, thanks. Yeah. Oh, do people, should people, like the people who participated tonight, do you have their contact or will they be able to know what the next steps are? I don't think we have anyone's direct contact information unless they've provided it to us previously or on Brian's email list. But uh, yeah, that last slide that John shared again is all of our contact information. Um, you can also find it from the, the agenda. Like how basically, however you found this meeting today, um, yeah, follow the paper trail and you will find us. We're happy to follow up with you directly. <laughs> And I think we have new email addresses actually from the survey. I think that we asked uh, whether you want to be contacted again. And so we, actually, we, have, a, we have a list there. All right. Thank you for all your work on this. And thank you all for staying late. I am appreciative. Thank you all for staying late. Yeah, thank you all. This is, uh, yeah, I know it's a lot for all of you. We look at this daily, but this is uh, <laughs> not your daily week usually. So we appreciate it. <laughs> and thanks to all the members of the public. that came out and stayed this late too. We all work other jobs and everything. It's great to hear more of your feedback at this time. Thanks everyone. Good night. Sure.